from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome. Welcome to the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress is the world's largest library. 162 million items, 836 miles of shelving. And it's also the home to historic recordings and movies. And the Library of Congress, for the first time, is celebrating a very interesting era in music. I happened to live through it. <laughs> and we had a presentation on fashion in the 70s. And I kept saying, that is an oxymoron. One of the best things, though, about living through it and reviewing the fashion and the recordings, though, is we could have crazy fashion because we had such great music. We were all thinner because we danced all night, and we really have contributed, I think, in our generation, and some of my colleagues are here that live through it, too, to showcasing the range and diversity of recorded sound. I'd like to greet live stream viewers on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you all for joining us. And today's symposium explores the cultural significance and the legacy of the disco culture. You'll hear from a range of distinguished speakers from the music world, academia, and broadcast journalism. We're so thankful to be hosting this wonderful celebration with cultural institutions and other organizations, including the Recording Academy, Brightest Young Things, we were back then, Capital Pride, the DC Library Association, and the Silent Dance Society. This program is made possible by the support of private donations, and we invite, and this is a shameless plug, we invite you to join us at loc.gov slash disco to make a contribution. We also are asking you to live tweet during the events using the hashtag LCDisco. And now for the first session. We are truly honored to have a woman who helps symbolize and create something that we all know just captures visually what disco was about. You've seen Miss Yolanda Baker on various news programs recently because she is quite a legend. She is the only remaining maker of disco balls in the United States through the Louis, uh, Louisville-based Omega National Products. She has handcrafted mirror disco balls for almost 50 years. I think that deserves a hand. Let me see my earrings. Yolanda's disco balls have been all over the world, including at the legendary Club 54 and on set of the film Saturday Night Fever, which celebrates its 40th anniversary this year and happens to be in the Library of Congress's National Film Registry. We are especially appreciative of her participating in this symposium on a day that probably is very important in the world of a Louisville, Kentucky native, the Kentucky Derby. We are also pleased to have joining us Tony Lehring with the Omega National Products, where she is the mayor of sales and service manager. She has worked with the company since 1994 and will share some tidbits with us about the history of the Mirror Disco Ball. And then Rona Wolf Friedman will moderate our first session. She is a commissioner on the District of Columbia Arts, Commission on Arts and Humanities, as well as a attorney and realtor in Washington, DC. 
And in addition to holding degrees in law and philosophy, she holds a degree in the history of decorative arts from the Smithsonian Parsons School of Design. So let's give them a big Library of Congress disco welcome. for being here. I'm going to introduce our illustrious speakers. And Tony is the Mirror and Sales Service Manager in the Mirror Division of Omega National Products based in Louisville, Kentucky. She's been an employee there for 23 years, starting in 1994. Omega is the premier manufacturer of wood cabinet accessories, as well as architectural mirrored products. These include disco balls and antique mirrors. Ms. Leering is a family person who loves cooking, hiking, camping, and reading. She's an avid fan of the University of Louisville sports. She has two daughters and one delightful grandson. Yolanda Baker is a production employee in the mirror division of Omega. Ms. Baker's worked at Omega for 49 years, since 1968. <laughs> She's an expert in the manufacturing of mirrored disco balls. She also does quality control for handcrafted mirrors. She's been married 51 years to her husband, Tom, and has one... <laughs> <laughs> One married son and two wonderful grandchildren. She enjoys family dinners, camping, and vacationing. Thank you again for being here on Derby Day. So we're going to start with a question for either one of you. Omega National Products make some of the best mirrors in the world. Can you please give us a little bit of an explanation about its origins? I can help you with that one. Thank you. Um, we've been making mirrors since 1946 when the company was founded. And it was made by hand, handcrafted. And at that time, most mirrors were. Um, we no longer can use mercury, but we still have artisans who can make the handcrafted mirrors on antique mirror, regular mirror, the gold vein mirror, all from like the Art Deco histories of furniture and furnishings and wall coverings. And I think the best thing to say is that because we make it in America, because our company is so family oriented. We just take great pride in our work and our craftsmanship. Thank you. Thank you. Can you explain the tie-in in the 1950s in America to deco furniture and mirror and the uh, desire for everyone to have their furniture mirrored? <laughs> well, as you, we talked about this before, but um, you know, a lot of the very wealthy wanted all of these replica furniture pieces. And then it was just a lot more affordable to have it mirrored rather than um, have the, the solid woods and the exotic woods that came from other countries. Um, and then, of course, we've had some um, mirrored furniture that tabletops and um, the Art Deco tables, uh, occasional tables. Uh, I really, I'm trying to think, I, I'm so sorry. But, you know, but I think, I think everybody um, loves to go into the room where it looks expanded. And I think that's what always, when you have a mirrored room, it, and it, it just sort of, um, it, the antique mirror sort of takes away from some of that mirrored image and makes it a softer look for people. And it's just kind of uh, elegant, uh, I think, and it, it shows a richness. Thank you. And now let's get a little bit into disco balls. Can, who wants to explain to us the origin of the disco ball? <laughs> no, no, no. She, she knows, believe me. Um, it didn't start in Louisville, Kentucky, I can tell you all that. And I really wish it did, but it right. didn't. Um, and we weren't alive when it started. So it started over in Europe. And, you know, and then it, it kind of, like in the 20s, you can see disco balls in old photographs of, you know, old speakeasies and ballrooms and 
you know, kind of incorporating with the chandeliers and all these grand ballrooms in Great Britain. And then, of course, it came over into America in, in the early 20s. Uh, but we um, didn't start actually manufacturing those until the 60s. We were making a flexible wall covering and then a flexible mirror covering. And that's what Yolanda does. And so then a company approached us and asked us if we would cover various sizes of, and shapes of spheres or unique shapes, different kinds of substrates. And that's when we started making those around 1960. What was the largest size of a disco ball you've ever made? Is also, what is the oddest one you've ever made? Well, I did a 10 foot. I'm sorry. I did a 10 foot ball for Coca-Cola. Okay. And the oddest thing I covered would, would be a saddle. <laughs> Four foot shoe. And, and a four foot shoe. A four I foot know. pump. How I did know. you cover a saddle? Did someone actually sit on that? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was for a display in a, in a bar. How you always Wow. Can you talk a little bit about the origins of the disco ball in your company? How you started getting into making them? Well, again, the, the company that approached us, and unfortunately I don't have that information, but they approached us because we were making, um, taking two foot by two foot glass sheets, we would silver them, we would put a cloth back, and the glass is scored. And so when we started doing that for wall coverings like um, cylinders and different curved walls, that's when the company was approached. We were making waste baskets like boudoir accessories, bathroom accessories. And then that's when the company came by and said, we'd like for you all to mass produce. And at that time, there were three people in the department, one person covering balls, one person making the shells, one person scoring the glass. And those three people grew into 28 people within about five years, making an average of 25 balls per person per day. So, so at that time, we really became the most That's revered in, in America as far as making disco balls. And they went global. I mean, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and if you'll notice, we make mirrored globes because disco balls weren't called disco balls until disco. So, yeah. So, and we still call them mirrored globes today. Do you still make furniture as well now? And we, antique mirrors and disco balls? What are you doing currently? Yeah, we don't make the mirrored furniture. We actually make the glass and mirror and then sell it through distribution, sell it through cabinet companies. Okay. I actually have a disco ball desk and credenza and occasional table in my office. So I love that story. You know, I said, y'all can't throw that away. Can you describe how you make a disco ball? Well, you have a sphere. Of what? Made of? It's aluminum. Okay. Aluminum shell. It's hollow on the inside. It has a hook on one end to, for the hanging. You take a belly band, is what I call it. It's a strip of glass, and you put it around the middle. It's glued on there. You put glue on the rest of the ball, and you proceed to curl up the ball. It's that simple. Simple, she says. <laughs> <laughs> and how long does it take you to make one of these balls? Uh, about, let's see, a 12 inch would probably take about 15 minutes. That's a 12 inch in diameter. Wow. Yeah. How, what was the longest time it took you to make one of these balls? The 10 footer. It was like two or three days, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Can you talk a little bit about the trends in the decorative arts in the 70s and 80s and how the balls were involved in culture? Oh, <laughs> I think a lot of people here could probably tell us the same. If you can remember, like I can remember in the 70s, and like you can remember, yeah. we've had customers come in, even before my time there at the company, they've covered shoes with disco ball material. Wow. Uh, we've had a bikini. <laughs> We've had um, just all kinds of different shapes, like she said, a lot of companies who wanted to brand their product, promote their product, and really catch the eye of the public to cover it. And I think after a while, everyone just thought it was so much fun. Every time you walk into a ballroom or, you know, a high school prom, anything that's, that's from that, that day when you were having just the best time with family, friends, 
everybody's getting together, dancing. Who doesn't love to dance? You know, I mean, seriously, who doesn't feel happier when they dance? And I think that really made a difference, and Disco Balls kind of brought that, that really wild person out of them and said, I'm going to be inhibited right now and have fun and enjoy I'll myself. And your skating rinks, that's right. Amusement park rides. I think it's just all a lot of fun when you think about a disco ball. And every time there's one hanging, somebody wants to get underneath of there and dance. <laughs> Was there one specific movie or a catalyst that brought our little disco ball to stardom? John Travolta. Yes. <laughs> Stay alive. And how did that happen? Do you know how that happened? No. We actually had a New York representative. Okay. And he promoted our products, like for Studio 54 and for Saturday Night Fever. Um, we know that Soul Train, the disco ball that they had at Soul Train, was shared with Johnny Carson's studio. I think that's fun. Although I never saw it on Johnny Carson's show. Uh, but, yeah, so I think, I think that... Uh, that movie, and then also we have other, um, other Vegas, the show, that was a TV show. We, we've had a lot of movie and TV production companies use disco balls and disco ball material. And you're the only company now that makes disco balls in the United States? As far as we know, we've been the only company. We're, we're still trying to find the documentation, but we know of no other retro disco ball manufacturer. And where do... Uh, companies get disco balls if they don't go to your company? Th through distributors. Um, there's some in Texas and in New York. I mean, they Florida. would go overseas as well? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, mm -hmm. the overseas market is... Yeah. <laughs> that, that, changed, that changed our company yeah. uh, a, a bit. You know, once the, the overseas companies learned how to make a disco ball and learned how to make it... Um, more economically, but not efficiently. And they just sort of swapped quantity for quality, uh, which is a shame. It helps us in a way because right. people keep coming back. Although I did have a customer recently that called and said, I need a new disco ball motor. I've had my 36 inch disco ball since 1968. He truly <laughs> said that. So we, you know when it's made by us, it's gonna last. You know, you mentioned disco balls are hollow, but are, are there, so I think of those big disco balls with these stars coming out of them. How does that work? You know, when you have some famous movie stars with balls that open up, do you make them that open up no, as well? No, ma'am. Uh, you don't. Okay. The only thing I remember about a star is Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> Riding out on it. Yeah. Riding out on that big disco ball you that you like. Down on that right, disco that's ball. what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. And it didn't break and it no. just. I make them good. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, and what makes your ball so unique? I think it's because it is the retro disco ball. It is that traditional disco ball. You have production companies for movies, and uh, Vegas, they have their own production companies that have made disco balls with video screens now and, and lights shooting out of it. We don't make that kind of disco ball. We make the traditional, original, retro disco ball. And who is ordering disco balls now? Well, we have, believe it or not, restaurants. Kane's restaurants are one of those. Um, again, we sell through distribution, so we don't always know exactly where our disco balls go. Um, we did open up some sales when NBC had, you know, came in and interviewed us, just because there was such a strong interest. And Yolanda has really gained global attention because everyone just loves her story that she's the longevity the fact that she just loves what she's doing and believe me you cannot imagine how fast she works you can't imagine how how tedious it can be she cuts each because we make those cloth sheets and she kind of cuts all those little facets and she puts them on the globe and they're beautiful. We have colored globes, we have custom made globes that have sandblasted company names on them. It's really tremendous what she does and then hanging on big hooks and she has to get underneath of them. She's really quite the craftsperson. Thank you. You're welcome. When you 
travel around the country or go to other seminars or on TV, do you run into other um, disco balls that you've made years ago? Oh, yes, yes, several times. I can always recognize them because of that belly band. Oh, okay. It's unique. Okay. It's, all, it's all in line, yeah. And then the end cap, too. Yeah, the end cap. Yeah. Interesting. What is your impression of how disco culture has influenced American pop culture over the years? Wow. Does it go back to a simpler time for you, or...? Yeah. I think so too. I think I think what happened. If I, I know, like I said, you all probably remember this too. But you know, for there for a while in the '60s, people weren't dancing together. They were all doing their own little thing. Let's do the monkey. Let's do the pony. You could do, you could dance all by yourself. And then when disco came back in, and when dancing with partners and ballroom dancing, you know, the elegance of that. And then all of a sudden, it just got really. You know, you got gymnastics in there. I mean, you really had some talented people coming out and dancing. And I just think it was such a wonderful art to watch. Well, thank you. And now it's time for a surprise that Yolanda and Tony have for the Library of Congress. And Dr. Hayden. And, you, oh, and your partner in crime, most definitely. Very and That's Robert Newland, <clears throat> the one I mentioned. We uh, didn't coordinate this. <laughs> but we both knew what to wear. Great minds think alike. <laughs> oh! Can you give it to them? Can you present it to Dr. Okay, so whose office is this going to go in, Robert? Yours. Got it? That's what I asked. I asked if we had a home. You got it? Let's see. A real Yolanda Baker disco ball with the Library of Congress on it. Yeah. And it's actually sandblasted, so that paint will stay on there. And you know, I'll never forget the belly band. I need one. And you can see the belly band. It's right there. Where is it? Right here, the right here. The four, it's wow. four pieces together that has the cloth back. And we are sharing this, it's sort of, you know, uh, something that we don't already share because Can people want to come in and see how we make those. Can you hold it? Oh, you look got at it? it. We're just trying to give you the disco feel. Whoa. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, don't forget we're live not. streaming. Uh, yes. Maybe not, maybe not. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you so you have it? much. Well, thank you Be for having careful. us. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. Oh, 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 it's not that heavy. It only weighs about 18 pounds. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and Robert's holding it. <laughs> and you'll be giving demonstrations? Please. You'll um, be giving demonstrations? Oh, on how to cover a disco ball? Oh, well, we don't have any materials with this. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. You don't want to give away your trade secret. No. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Well, well thank you so much. I just much. want to thank Yolanda and Tony for coming here, especially once again on their favorite day, Louisville, Kentucky, the Kentucky Derby. So let's give them all. <laughs> thank you. Thank all of you. As you know, this is just the beginning of Disco at the Library of Congress, so we hope you'll participate in some of the other programs today. And I have to just give you a sneak preview. I'll be changing into different outfits. So, <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you so much.
Hello, everyone. Um, it is such an honor uh, to be here today in the presence of uh, the disco ball, um, that iconic uh, centerpiece for uh, us or for generations of us who were reveling and dancing to it. Um, what I want to express particular pleasure in is the perhaps kaleidoscopic colors that shine through in its fragmented mirror glass. And uh, what I want to do is to take up that theme and reflect some of the way in which the world's diversity in all its fragments is in some ways reflected um, in it. Um, but first, I just want to take a quick moment to uh, thank some of the people that uh, I couldn't uh, be up here without, uh, particularly uh, Wills Glasspiegel, who's at Yale University, a former colleague of mine, um, who uh, does a lot of interesting film work, uh, uh, filming dancers around the world, um, and who uh, was very much part of this project, um, as well as all the people working in the uh, background, uh, John doing the audio vision, uh, everybody here at Library and Congress um, who are so professional and have been so wonderful. Uh, but above all, David Plylar and Susan Vita for their invitation. It is an honor and I am humbled by uh, the opportunity to speak here today. Okay. About a third of the way through her track Hold Up on her fascinating visual album Lemonade, released about a year ago, Beyonce emerges from a scene in which she appears to be floating or suffocating perhaps underwater, under the claustrophobic weight of a kind of betrayal and hopelessness. She intones with a stark voiceover, I tried to change, close my mouth more. We hear the weird sounds of audio reverse and reverb accompanying this kind of confessional manifesto. Is it a baptism? Is it a drowning? Death? Rebirth? Perhaps it's death because she proclaims, I swallowed a sword. But then also immediately she says, I confessed my sins and was baptized in a river. As the story of the song shifts from narration into music, two golden doors open perhaps a modern temple, or even a state institution like this one. And she enters the music video as a singer, not as a narrator. Water, no longer drowning her, breaks through the door, released like a rebirth. Getting to the many levels of what Beyonce is doing is an extremely difficult thing to do. Her works are increasingly sophisticated with endless numbers of references. According to the official title release, this was about a woman's journey to self-knowledge and healing. But at the same time, the references are so proliferate to Christian and Afro-Caribbean-based spiritual practices, references to Black Lives Matter, motherhood, betrayal, love, high art works, Films, literature, such as Julie Dash's cult classic, Daughters of the Dust in 1992, it indexes so much of a bigger world. Even that Roberto Cavalli dress tells a story, because it is not just a dress, it is a reference to the figure of Oshun, the Yoruba goddess of female sensuality, love and fertility, known as the mother of the sweet waters in Nigeria. Not only do we find that reference in the dress, but also in her recent appearance as a pregnant woman um, at the Grammys. Um, what the dress signifies is the flowing uh, water following the great goddess of uh, Oshun. Of course, Oshun marks a real place in the world, and here I want to show you just the shrine of, a, a shrine of Oshun in southwest Nigeria, near Sogbo region, in the Osun state. That's on the left, where she's depicted as a mermaid. On the right, we have Cuban believers who participate in the procession of Our Lady of Charity, depicted here as the Oshun goddess, goddess in the Yoruba religion in Havana. This was to celebrate her 400th anniversary of her apparition. The Yoruba deity, of course, is known to heal the sick, to cheer the sad, to bring music and song and dance, as well as bring fertility and prosperity. She is the protector of the poor, the mother of all orphans. But why is Beyonce conjuring the deity so vividly? It is clear that Beyonce brings aspects of Hoshun's legacy 
right down to her own living legacy. I mean, just in, 19, in 2015, uh, she donated seven million for the Knowles Tenemos uh, Place Apartments, a kind of homeless shelter in Houston, uh, which provides meals, job readiness training, HIV screenings, case management, and so on. And then just last month, Beyonce initiated a new scholarship program for young women studying creative arts, music, film, and African-American studies. These are called the Formation Scholars. But I want to draw attention to something else, because there's more going on than just these real-world interventions. As Amy Yeboa, who teaches Africana studies at Howard University, says in this quote, Beyonce takes the power of women's spirituality deeper into African spirituality. We see this in the first of two baptisms and her emergence as an Orisha. What's interesting about this is that she focuses on the image as being able to tell a story. This is visual storytelling. Instead of looking at the lyrics, we're looking at the imagery. The power of the imagery to narrate a scene. Images, one might say, speak. And they speak in ways that is not fully capturable in words. What I want to show today is that it is not just images that speak, but also sounds. Sounds and rhythms, they speak. As a South African, I want to draw particular attention to Beyonce's ongoing perception with African music, with African rhythms, African ideas, and cosmologies. These index a much larger history and take us into the global framework for her music. But let's go back a few years uh, to that moment in the middle of the Obama years where, in some sense, Beyonce was still rising dramatically in her stature. It was just before she became the go-to artist for everything ranging from the Super Bowl to the singer of the national anthem at the presidential inauguration. And here, I want to just play a song from that period, just a short fragment from the beginning uh, to remind us of that time. Sorry. Okay, I'll stop the song there at this uh, quite striking image to which I will return. We're in 2011. The song is called Run the World, Girls, uh, 2011 from the album Four. Uh, musically speaking, we can talk about a kind of electro-funk groove, perhaps, drawing elements of contemporary R&B, electronica, soul, uh, and elements of neo-disco. The meaning of the song is what's perhaps least argued about. It is a message, according to the official account, of promoting female empowerment. In Beyonce's words, I try to write songs that will bring out the best in all of us and keep us close together. I think about saying the things that women want to say, but sometimes are not confident enough to say. I'm going to continue to write those songs that give women strength. And all the way across from Billboard to Pitchfork, which is sort of on the opposite ends of the spectrum of the music bloggery, um, there's a basic agreement that this is about female empowerment. It also was the song that woke up um, the final mission of the US space shuttle Atlantis, where the female mission specialist Sandra Magnus was on board. Um, and it initiated a period, even in places like where I work, in universities, of people beginning to study this phenomenon called Beyonce. Kevin Allred at Rutgers University had a syllabus that connected her to a kind of black feminist optic, uh, a messenger for social change by way of bell hooks, Alice Walker, Sojourner Truth, and Beyonce Knowles. So the message of the song seems quite clear, but let's go to the music. 
what's going on in the music. And here, I want to just draw attention to the fact that uh, a couple of days ago, I gave an, a, a talk about um, the way in which American music, from punk and soul, uh, uh, funk and soul to Motown, disco, and so, on, and so on, is often derived in large measure from African music, both by way of African American music and also particularly by way of the Afro Caribbean influence. And today, I want to tell that kind of story, which we might call a biography of musical fragments and patterns, or what my colleague Arjun Apadurai would call the social life of a sound, by looking at some of the details of Beyonce's song. Let's start with that syncopated, syncopated a bell pattern that. Okay. Where does that come from? It's a kind of block party invitation, a summons to come to an event, um, and then has that strange synthesized vocoder like cartoon voice above it, kind of Mickey Mousing it. And as the music enters, it sort of erupts into a kind of supreme being energized by the rhythm. Beyonce suddenly is enlivened, almost in pantheistic manner, uh, also drawing on a standard cabaret move. But the track itself comes from Major Lazer's track, Pond de Floor, from an album called Guns Don't Pe uh, Kill People, Lasers Do. Uh, Major Lazer was working in Jamaican dance hall tradition at this point. Um, he's a white DJ from um, uh, Florida and by the name of Wesley Pence. And he, is, he was first sort of became more popularized or mainstream, one might say, uh, when he wrote Paper Planes for MIA, which was that, this kind of soundtrack to Slumdog Millionaire. At any rate, this had been circulating quite widely in Jamaica um, in 2009 and 2010 uh, before um, Beyonce uh, decided to use it as the central track for um, Girls Around the World. So it was already, as I say, widely circul circulating. Let me give you some examples of how it was circulating. Here is Busy Signal's um, rendition or version of it called Pon Me. Okay, I'm sorry to cut it off like that, but we need to try cover a bit more ground than one wants to. Um, but uh, this is uh, directly related to all the typical sound of Jamaican dub and dancehall music, what is sometimes called versioning, or what my colleague Michael Veal calls uh, um, uh, the aesthetics of accumulation, or the rhythm method. In this way, there's a kind of audio meme or a dance track that circulates amongst different DJs and producers, and they repurpose that in different contexts and toast over it or, or rap over it uh, in, 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 different, in, in different ways. The tradition of repurposing existing technology, whether it's the turntable in hip hop or mixing desks and so on, um, had a long legacy also in Jamaica and is part of the dance hall scene. I want to, however, push that even further to 19th century Suriname. Because if we listen closely to the track, it was also had a very powerful snare drum influence. And that snare drum influence was probably mediated by a DJ called Afro Jack, who was the co-producer on the track. And he was drawing on a regional dance style from Suriname. In Suriname, this particular dance style known as Kacheco or Kaseko uh, is played at 45 beats per minute, in other words, just a little bit faster than Jamaican dance hall, and itself draws on the tradition, a kind of calypso-like style inflected with marching rhythms from the colonial time in Suriname. This is interesting because uh, during this time you have um, black bands playing in military, um, uh, black, black performers playing in military bands as part of the colonial regime but they shift the cadences of that European canon in a way to reflect their own musicalization. That's where the syncopations come in, the creolization, we might call it. Here's a typical track of this bubbling music. Bubbling is the sort of DJ version of this older Calypso Kacheco style, and this is um, DJ Chucky, probably one of the most prominent uh, DJs. <laughs> Now let's go to Johannesburg in South Africa. 
Here, I'm going to show you a short clip of a dance troupe called Real Actions, part of what is known as the Pansula scene in South Africa. In this case, this is probably our most important Pansula group at the moment. I'll tell you more about them. Let's watch how they move. Okay, as you see, this is a quite virtuosic, low stepping, but quick, low to the ground kind of urban street culture that has its origins in South African townships and draws heavily from the uh, Mbaklanga and Marabi musical traditions. Quick darting steps, geometric lines, uneven rhythmic quality, and so on. The word pansula itself actually means to waddle like a duck. And if you try to move like a duck, you will find yourself moving like a pansula. A sort of flat-footed, we might say, African tap and glide uh, is, uh, style, often with the buttocks out. Other dance moves often also follow the um, sort of uh, metaphors of daily life. There's one called meta meta, which means like putting butter um, on bread. Now, Beyonce's choreography by Frank Gatson officially drew on this Pansula tradition, but she actually didn't work with real actions. Instead, she went across the border to Mozambique to another troupe called Tofu Tofu. Tofu Tofu means, or Tofu means, shaking the body. Uh, this is another derivation of what real actions are doing, and in some ways looked down upon by uh, real actions as being derivative itself of like the real Pansula uh, back home. Here is the connection between what uh, Beyonce found on a YouTube clip, the Tofu tofu performers and then the relationship that took takes to the choreography um, in the video. This is actually a slightly different reference but we'll get to the one related to tofu tofu in a minute. I'm, again, cutting it a little short so one can go into this in much more detail. But I would just want to draw your attention to one small detail of the dance, and that, that in, in Pansula dancing, uh, there's many different styles. Some are called Western style, there's slow poison, there's futuza. And what they're doing is uh, uh, dancing a little bit more of the futuza style, which means your arms are kind of wrapped quite tightly um, around the torso while the feet do a lot of moving. It was this that was tricky for Frank uh, Gatson to work with, and beyond Beyonce had the singers actually flown out uh, to LA to choreograph the official dancers because they couldn't quite get that relaxed feeling uh, together. Um, of course, uh, real actions were not that happy about this. They thought that Tofu Tofu had, in some sense, brought their culture down, um, that this was not the original Pansula, that they humiliated us, I'm quoting. While at the same time, they did express a certain kind of pride in the act of recognition from someone as um, great as Beyonce. Um, but now I just want to briefly make one more detour through Africa, and that is, what about the imagery? What about those visuals? The bull, the hyena, and the lion. Where do they come from? Um, particularly this uh, quite striking scene from Tbilisi, on the sign, which is unfortunately hidden behind the chain in her right hand, is the sign to Tbilisi, which is the capital of Georgia, which at the time was not uncontroversial, um, because it was the Israelis had just closed down their embassy in that region, and so on. But these hyenas on a chain, these are interesting. What do they call up? One might say that there's like sort of exoticized invocations of advertising for, you know, 
colonial Euro European tourism back in the days of Rhodesia. Um, or, more positively, one might say, you know, maybe it's because hyenas themselves are a deeply matriarchal animal. Here's what Kevin Richardson, a conservationist in South Africa, has to say about them. Well, hyenas are really interesting animals because, unlike lions, they do have a strict hierarchy. Completely misunderstood, where everyone thinks that they are just smelly, rotten scoundrels and scavengers. They do not smell. They're not rotten. And the interesting thing really is that the lowest ranking female ranks higher than the highest ranking male, if that makes sense. But the true reference for these images is actually the artistic photojournalism of Peter Hugo, another South African photographer who has a particular interest in photographing marginalized peoples around the world, um, such as blind people, um, albinos, AIDS victims in their coffins, and so on. This is edgy photography. And in fact, Beyonce is conjuring that imagery quite strikingly in Hugo's Hyena and Other Men portraits. Um, the, the, the Gadawankura, whom you see here, are itinerant minstrels in Nigeria, in Abuja, who perform with pet hyenas and other wild animals, baboons, snakes, and so on, to entertain crowds, to make music with them, a kind of miniature circus, and sell traditional medicines. Here are a few more of these striking images. What's interesting about them is that um, in South Africa, there's been a long kind of genealogy or history of critical realism um, in South African documentary photography that dates back to the Bang Bang Club, as they were known, photographers who were deeply involved with um, the anti-apartheid struggle and would go into dangerous regions and take photographs. Some got shot. Uh, um, others, such as Kevin Carter, actually committed suicide in 1994 when he won a Pulitzer Prize for taking an image of a starving Ethiopian child with a circling vulture, he found himself also facing a lot of controversy. A few months later, um, he was dead. In Hugo's words, what he's trying to do is problematize the, the very way in which one captures images. He says, I am of a generation that approaches photography with a keen awareness of the problems inherent in pointing the camera at anything. And just to be clear, a year before the release of um, uh, Girls Around the World, um, there was an exhibition called Permanent Error, uh, 2009 to 2010, um, which uh, was uh, driving home the darker side of his portraiture, um, looking at a place called Agba Bloshi in Ghana, where he was looking at the way in which digitalia, our digital debris, circulates in the world. One of the deep sadnesses of the history of um, digital um, lifespans is that they begin in Africa uh, through the extraction of cassiterite and columite tantalite in the Congo and so on, often under very severe uh, conditions, and then find their way back when we dump our waste back in Africa. And here you see uh, the Agbo Bloshi um, uh, toxic waste dump site where people are trying to extract a living um, out of uh, this um, uh, misguided policy of shipping millions of tons of obsolete materials um, in that direction. Uh, Peter Hugo's response when he he was, when it was raised that this was what Beyonce was referencing, said, uh, you know, he, he was um, not sure if it fitted really into the song, but uh, that he did feel that perhaps the hyena men uh, might be looking for compensation uh, for some of their efforts in that um, production. Um, I want to make one final point before um, closing for today, because it's a purely musical point. We spoke about a little bit about the way in which um, the snare drums that had been brought in were referencing this calypso style um, cacheco and so on, we had gotten to um, the Afro-Caribbean world. What's often forgotten in accounts that you find on Wikipedia or in the blogosphere or in the, the, you know, the, the, the large scale media is the next step. Where did that come from? And I want to draw attention to these clave patterns that, um, that are being drawn on, that striking pattern that goes like this. the forward clave pattern, which if I were to put a beat to it, would be something like this. Okay, that is very strikingly, if you speed up uh, the, um, that pattern a little bit, you get precisely that opening track. Okay, 
Now, where does that sound come from? We know it as being this, uh, this um, uh, associated with the son clave pattern, but I want to return it back to its origins, which is in Africa. And the way you feel that pattern in Africa is just a little bit different. Instead of you play it this way. Now you will hear, in some ways, all I'm doing is playing a pattern a little bit more slowly. But in fact, I'm playing it in a different pulse. So if I'm playing this one and it's going and the other one, the one is going one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, and the other one, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And it's this change or the transformation of ternary time, we call it, in threes, to binary time that I'd like to note um, in my closing remarks. Um, where does this pattern come from? It's hard to find a region in Africa where it doesn't play a role. But I'm just going to play you um, one of the typical bell patterns that is associated with gankugoi, which is um, a, a, a bell uh, instrument with two uh, tones, um, and uh, is part of an ensemble usually such as agbekor or agbaja. And here's the way in slow motion that that particular bell pattern sounds. Seven strokes before it begins again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Okay. If I play a second part, and I'm just going to have to demonstrate this quickly, here is the bell pattern. And I play all the spaces in between that, which is what your rattle player in this ensemble will do. That is what will become the clave pattern as it crosses over into the Afro-Caribbean. Okay? So it's within the sort of rattling of this particular ensemble that that clave pattern is embedded. One way in which we find a transformation taking place is that instead of hearing that in ternary time, as I said, we hear it in binary time, but what is striking about the African version is that you can hear that pattern in any of many ways. So if I play you that pattern again, I'm going to beat out different quote-unquote drum beats against it. Or, or, okay. What's interesting about it is that it's organized in such a way, for those of you that can read set theory, that it can entrain our bodies in any of many different time signatures at the same time. Um, the structure of it is long, long, short, long, 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 short a little bit like the structure of the white notes on a piano, where you have a tone, tone, half tone, 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 half tone. And it is that ambiguity, that possibility for entraining the body in many different ways that is in some sense lost when it moves over into the Afro-Caribbean and becomes something that is a little more shoehorned into binary time. It is that small loss that I want to register when we look in more depth into what these, what's at stake globally into all these musics that take us in some, sometimes to some sad places such as the toxic uh, waste dump site in Agbo Bloshi and, so, and also into a time signature that is a little less than what it was in its origin. Okay, thank you very much.
Hello. Are you out there? Uh, my name is Bill Bernstein. I'm a photographer, and I'm beyond honored to be here at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And um, I wanted to thank Dr. Hayden. I th think Dr. Hayden's here, but thank you for opening up the Library of Congress to this kind of craziness. <laughs> it's uh, refreshing, I think. Um, <clears throat> I want to just talk about uh, my experience uh, with, with the disco culture. Um, I photographed disco from 1977 to 1979, and um, I was thrown into this culture. Um, I'll give you a little background about myself. I was born in the 50s. Um, I was one of the Woodstock generation. Uh, the first big cultural phenomenon that I remember as a kid was when the Beatles came over to America on the Ed Sullivan Show. And that, for me, kind of changed everything. I became a musician. I got a set of Ludwig drums. And um, I played in a rock band in high school. And I guess my culture as a, as a young man was kind of the hippie culture, although I wasn't a full-fledged hippie, but um, that was kind of where I came from. So we were, you know, um, anti-war, uh, we were mostly white, middle class, long-haired, suburban, most, a lot of us. Um, I got tear gassed in the mall, like right down the street here, in 1970, when I was protesting the war. Um, anyway, after I got out of college, I decided to become a photographer, and this is in the 70s. <clears throat> and the first place that would hire me, I guess, was the Village Voice in New York City. And uh, this was in about 1976. Um, and. Uh, so I was photographing a lot of street photography and portraiture, that kind of thing. And one night I was asked to, I was assigned to go to Studio 54 uh, to photograph a, an awards presentation for um, Lillian Carter, who was Jimmy Carter, the president's mother. She was being awarded a um, humanitarian award. And I had never been to Studio 54 before, and I had no kind of no interest in going. I had a curiosity, but I, I was not a big fan of, of disco music. And at that time, my rock station in New York uh, overnight turned from rock to all disco. <laughs> and a lot of people were a little bit confused and not happy with that. Um, so I was well aware of the fact that disco was happening. And I saw Saturday Night Fever, which came out in 1977. And so it was, it was a phenomenon that was occurring. And um, I consider myself a photojournalist, a portrait photographer, and a bit of a uh, cultural anthropologist. I like, to, I like to get involved in different cultures and um, look at them and photograph them. And um, disco certainly was its own culture. So anyway, the, I was sent to Studio 54, and this is what it looked like from the outside. It was a very difficult place to get into. It opened up in 77, and there was always a, they, they started the velvet rope policy, where people would stand outside and be chosen, you know, based on, I'm not exactly sure what, but I know if you were a celebrity, you had a good chance of getting in, but not Oh, you didn't always get in, but you had a good chance. Um, so this is what I saw the first night that I got there. And when I walked inside, this is what I encountered. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd never seen anything like this before. Um, I was used to, you know, shooting on the street, or if I was shooting a, a portrait, I would have the person pretty much all to myself. Uh, 
And so this was, you know, the, the word paparazzi was kind of a new word back in 1977. And, you know, here they are. They're just like on top of each other. And to me, as a photographer, this was more interesting a, a shot than what they were shooting. <laughs> but that's what they were shooting. So that's Lillian Carter and sitting next to Andy Warhol. And that's the shot that the Village Voice sent me to get, which I, which I got. And then I decided that after the event was over that I would, uh, I would stay because I didn't know if I could ever get back in again. <laughs> um, so I bought 10 rolls of film from a photographer who was leaving, from one of those guys. Um, and I basically hung, hung out in the shadows up in the balcony so I didn't get kicked, kicked out and waited for the regular crowd to come in. They put all the tables away and cleaned up and then the regular cr crowd came in. And um, <clears throat> this is really one of the very first pictures that I took that night in 77. This was in December of 77. Studio 54 had opened, uh, I think about a month or two before that. Studio 54 was actually open from 77 to 79, which is like, it was like two and a half years, something like that. When I tell people that, they can't believe it because they think it was open for like 10 years, but it was a very, very short period of time when it was owned by Steve Rebell and Ian Schrager, who were the original creators of Studio 54. Um, so this is the first picture that I really took after I took this shot for the Village Voice. And as I was taking this picture, I think I, this might be the only real frame that I got. I got a couple of pictures of them from the back and then I asked them if I could shoot them and then I shot this and then went on to shoot something else. But it really stuck in my mind because it reminded me of a pre-war Berlin cabaret. Um, and I started to think about that. And I remember, you know, seeing the the movie Cabaret and just, you know, the whole sort of gender bending um, undertone, a sort of gay undertone and it, sadomasochistic and it, just a, a lot of things sort of popped into my mind when I photographed this couple. And I started looking around, this was later that night, and, and I just started to have, see these images all around me. Um, of this pre-war Berlin cabaret sort of thing. This was a group that was, um, they, would, they came in all together and they, through the course of the night they would dance together, the guys would dance with the guys, the, sometimes the, the two guys would sandwich the girl on the dance floor. I, I didn't know who was who or what was what with them, but they were like this group that hung out together, and they were in, in this own little bubble. And I just kept an eye out on them. And when they got on the couch like this, I was across the floor, and I just thought, that's really an interesting picture. So I sort of like hoped I could get across the floor with my camera without them moving, you know, without them getting up and, and leaving, which I did. And I walked over and I snapped a couple of shots, and that was it. And <clears throat> People asked me if this was posed, and it was not posed at all. It was the, they were posing, but not for me. I mean, they were posing before I got there. And it's like, almost like they felt like, as I watched them that night, that they were sort of the stars of the evening. Um, and they had this, you know, aura about them. Um, and they were in this little bubble, so. Um, I chose at the very beginning when I went to Studio 54 not to photograph celebrities. It was like an early decision. And the reason I did that uh, was a couple of reasons. First of all, everybody was shooting the celebrities. And that's what photographers were doing at, at places like Studio 54. And they were all kind of getting the same shot. So I thought, you know, if I want to shoot a celebrity, I want them like in my studio with my lighting and I want to talk to them and, you know, interact. And 
get a picture, you know, get something that I, I want to get and not just sort of snap a picture of them sitting on a couch. So I, I decided that I didn't want to shoot celebrities. But I also thought that what was more interesting than the celebrities were like the people <clears throat> who went there and the people who like lived the disco life. Um, and I started to see things also. This is, looks like a transgender woman with like a sort of a straight Wall Street banger type guy. Um, and I started to realize that there was something really interesting going on at the disco. Um, I wasn't exactly sure what it was. It wasn't crystal clear in my mind, but I, I felt like there's something really interesting here from a, a photographic point of view and just from a cultural point of view. And what it was, was it was this freedom of expression. It was this, you know, openness, acceptance, inclusion um, that I had never seen before. And what was happening was, um, let me move on. What was happening is during the 60s and early 70s, there was the women's movement, there was the civil rights movement, there was post Stonewall, you know, it was the LGBT movement. Um, and all of these movements sort of came together. At the same time, disco happened. And the disco was a place for all of these different movements to go and have what one writer described as a victory dance. So they were all there in unison having their victory dance. And um, I'd never seen anything like this. You know, you know, again, I'm coming from the Woodstock generation. And if you go back and take a look at the movie Woodstock, um, you can probably count on one hand how many African Americans there are in the audience. They're all mostly white, uh, long haired, you know, middle class kids. Um, most of the entertainers were African American or, you know, Hispanic, but the audience itself was, was not like this kind of inclusion. Um, you didn't see that many transgenders in uh, the Woodstock movie, you know? Um, so uh, this was all completely new to me. It was just, um, I was just, my eyes were, you know, bugging out of my head by what I was seeing. It just seemed like a place of freedom of expression and, and you know, be who you want to be. And it was, it was young, old, and this, this was a particular interesting character named Rolla Rina. And <laughs> Rolla Rina had this gown, I guess it is, you know, and, and the glasses and the hat and this magic wand and roller skates. <laughs> and um, he was a fixture in um, Greenwich Village. You would see him all the time, you know, out roller skating around, and he would bless you with his wand. <laughs> um, and he was a fixture at um, most of the, like Xenon was one of the big discos and Studio 54. This is Disco Sally, who was, I believe in her mid 70s, she was a lawyer and her husband was a lawyer and her husband died. And um, she was left alone and heartbroken and Never been to a disco, but some friend said, come on out, let's go you know, to Studio 54. And she went and she absolutely loved it and she became a regular at Studio 54 and Xenon. People used to, young, usually young African Americans or Hispanic muscular guys, young guys, would, she'd wrap her legs around them and they would spin her around. <laughs> Again, this is, you know, really just freedom of expression and, and a safe place to be and a safe haven. Uh, this is a contact sheet, and I, I don't know how, I can't really see you people, but I don't know how many people know what a contact sheet is. <laughs> yeah, good. That's, that's heartening to know. But 
when I started shooting, um, that's, what we, that's what we had to deal with. Um, we, I would go at at night with my Canon F1 and my Vivitar 273 flash, and I would shoot with Tri-X film, which was the fastest film of its day. It was 400 ASA. And I needed fast film because these clubs were dark. Like, I'm looking out here now, this was, this was, some clubs were as dark as this, but there'd be flashing lights. So I would have a moment to focus my camera when a light flashed on. But it was a really difficult shooting situation that took me a long time to figure out. Um, but so what I did was, when I was seriously shooting a lot for this project, um, I would go out sometimes till about four in the morning and I'd come back and I'd take my 10, 15 rolls of film, I'd put it on my, my table, and I'd go to sleep, and I had an assistant that would come in around 10 o'clock in the morning and develop the film and hang it up to dry. And I would rise at about four in the afternoon and have a really strong cup of coffee or two and sit and I'd make a contact sheet and I'd sit and look at it, and I'd see if I got anything the night before, because you know it's not like being able to shoot and look at the back of your camera and say, "Oh, yeah, that's good." You know, you had to wait and look at the contact sheet. So that was the process that I went through to to shoot. Um, and uh, you know, honestly, I don't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> Much easier to shoot digitally. Uh, another thing at the disco in this particular time period was the um, evolution of uh, the technology of the sound system. Now, if you remember, well, you won't remember this, but when the Beatles played at Shea Stadium, the sound that they, that they played, the speakers that, that they played through, were the little bullhorns that you know, they would announce the next you know, batter. Um, that was the technology of the day. Well, this is you know, now 10 years later, and the speaker system was incredible. And you know, the, the mixing devices and the amplifiers were very high tech. This is, a, this is really the only female DJ that um, I photographed or found in New York City during that period. And I'm not saying there weren't others um, that I didn't find, but at one of the major uh, discos, this was the only one, this was a place called Sybil's. It's pretty much a, a, a men's club, and I think it still is to some extent today, although I've met some amazing female DJs um, in the last few years. So it's, you know, they're kind of breaking through. This is, uh, these are the speakers. I mean, they're, they're huge. And like this is, um, this would be a one sort of set of speakers here. And in some of the clubs, they would just have these speakers lining the wall. So when they played, you know, that, you know, the disco beat, the bass especially, it would really rock your insides. And you would like get a physical high just even if you had done no drugs and walked in off the street, just if you were standing in that room for a while, you would actually, your insides would start to shake and you, know, you, would, you would get high just from being there. So you add the drugs and the alcohol to that and you know, it was a, a pretty amazing scene. So after Studio 54, I decided that this is interesting and um, I wanted to see what else was going on. This is, again, this is 77, 78. I wanted to see what else was going on in um, Manhattan in um, the five boroughs. So I went to, this is 2001 Odyssey where um, Saturday Night Fever was filmed. And it wasn't exactly the most, it was in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and it wasn't exactly like the upscale Manhattan disco. It was kind of like a local, disco. Um, this is the floor that was um, in the movie. It was actually built by um, Robert Stigwood and his, his production people. 
um, but it stayed in um, 2001 Odyssey after they left. And when the building was torn down sometime later, some private collector bought this floor. And I don't know where it is, but I, somewhere in, probably in California, in LA, in somebody's basement, <laughs> is this floor, and he has parties on Saturday night. <laughs> Uh, this is really one of the most famous clubs of its time. I don't know if all of you know of it. Yeah. This was an amazing, amazing club. And it's, I think, it, you know, those who knew about it then were all over it. But people are just beginning to, um, to find out about Paradise Garage. And it had a couple of things going for it. It was a, uh, it was a you know, members club. Uh, they didn't serve alcohol, they served uh, juice and um, fruit, but people brought their own poppers, you know, emyl nitrate and alcohol and grass and, you know, there was plenty to get um, stoned on when you were there. But the great thing about this club is this guy. Larry Levan. And there's not, I don't have enough time to really talk about Larry Levan. It, it's a whole, you know, lecture in itself. Because this guy is, um, this guy really created modern DJing in a lot of ways. And I've spoken to a lot of DJs today, and everybody looks at Larry Levan as being pretty much the major innovator of, of a lot of different styles. And he played every kind of music that he, that he wanted to. You know, most of the clubs, they were handed music by the record companies and said, you know, here's the great hot one to play, you know. Larry Levan would look at it and go, I'll listen to it, you know. But he would play rock and roll, he would play rhythm and blues, you know, Motown. Pretty much played everything. I wasn't there that night, but I heard one night, he really liked the, the Pat Benatar song, um, Love is a Battlefield. I don't know if you know that song. But he really liked that song, so he played it like 10 times in a row. <laughs> you know, because he really liked it. And he had a way of really hypnotizing his audience. They loved him. They used to call his, his, um, his playing a Saturday Mass. They'd go for Saturday Mass, which started Saturday and ended like way late Sunday. Um, so there's... Volumes that have been written about Larry Levan, um, well worth reading about. This is what the dance floor looked like at um, Paradise Garage. Mostly Hispanic and, and African American, although the thing about these clubs is that, you know, if, if a white person walked in there, if a transgender woman walked in there, if, you know, anybody walked in there, it wouldn't have been a problem, but most, most clubs had their sort of like group, but it had that inclusiveness to it, you know? This is another one of my most favorite clubs that a lot of people never heard of. It's called Gigi's Barnum Room, and it used to be the Peppermint Lounge where the uh, twists started. Um, and after the Peppermint Lounge closed, it turned into Gigi's Barnum Room, which was a transgender men and women's haven, basically. It was like their club. And they had a net over the dance floor, and they had the disco bats performing. Um, it was a mixed crowd. It was, you know, all kinds of people went there. Um, yeah, there it is, too. Um, and this is... Uh, this is a picture that's sort of become famous from my book. Um, it's, this is a transgender, pre-op transgender named Ava, who I actually saw so many times when I went there that finally we sat down and actually had a long conversation. It was very interesting. So, you know, a, a middle-class Jewish boy like myself sitting, talking to a transgender, pre-op transgender woman at a club like this, it was just, you know, it was an amazing experience, and you know, I just learned a lot just by doing this. It opened up my mind a lot. 
It became a place where if you were an out-of-towner, you would stop in and go to Gigi's Barnum Room. Another club named Crisco Disco. <laughs> um, but pretty much a gay club, but again, became so popular that it became one of those, you know, let's stop off at Crisco Disco before we go home, you know, at four in the morning. And that Crisco can was the DJ booth in the back there. Another club, I wanted to hit all of these clubs. So another club is the Mud Club. Um, a little applause. <laughs> Uh, this was considered an anti-disco. They didn't like Studio 54, you know, they were political. Um, they didn't like the commercialism, but it became very, very popular and they ended up having like a velvet rope outside after a while too. So, um, this is a famous bathroom at the Mud Club. And I won't go into the stories, but just trust me, it was a famous bathroom. Um, this is a place called Haraz, which is another kind of anti-disco. Also went to uh, Roller Disco, which was big. And Roller Disco was a place of sweat and competition and a lot of fun. And if you were a good skater, you know, you put on your skates and you head out for the Empire Disco in, in Brooklyn and you, you know, showed everybody your moves. And again, didn't matter if you were white, African American, whatever, you know, it was, um, you know, it was a competition and it was fun. I was a little nervous going here, to tell you the truth, because it was in a part of Brooklyn that I didn't know, and it was mostly African American, but the minute I walked in, I was completely at ease and, and at home. There we go. So. A couple of things happened in like 1979 that uh, changed the disco scene. And I, I, I sort of say sometimes that it, it ended disco, but that's not exactly true. And there's a writer, Tim Lawrence, who wrote a book about life and death on a New York uh, dance floor uh, about disco from the 80s to, I think, 80 to 83. And he describes, you know, the fact that it did keep going and it was still creative and it was still happening. But the disco that I knew and the disco that I experienced was, in my opinion, over um, in like 1979, 1980. The first thing that happened was Studio 54, famous Coke and, and um, Coke Spoon and Moon, um, they were closed down by the IRS. And what happened was, um, Steve Rebell and Ian Traeger were skimming the cash registers and taking the money and putting it in the ceiling panels of the office. You know, they'd come down every couple of hours and take the cash out of the drawers. And Steve Rebell, who wasn't always the most sober person, um, every time I saw him, he'd go, who are you again? You know, and I met him all the time. Um, Bill Bernstein from The Voice, oh yeah, yeah. And so, anyway, so Steve Rebell one night was being interviewed and, they, and, and he said, you know, if the IRS knew how much money we really made, they'd shut us down. <laughs> and so guess what happened about two days later? Um, and they went to jail and uh, that place was shut down. It, it, it opened up under some new ownership, but you know, to me, it was never the same. There was a cultural backlash against disco music, disco culture. The rock and rollers uh, wanted their music back. They got sick of, of disco music. And there was a, there was a racial overtone to it um, that you know, is, you know, is pretty much clearly there. Um, but it was, there was a racial yeah, there was a racial overtone, but it, um, disco, disco became unpopular, and it became sort of a dirty word. Uh, so that happened. And then in, I believe it was 1981, um, the New York Times published an article saying that there was an AIDS epidemic, and that it was spreading. And 
everybody knew something was going on. They called it the, the gay cancer. But um, they officially declared it uh, an epidemic. And so what happened was people didn't know anything when AIDS was first announced. And so they were afraid that if you're talking to somebody and they accidentally like spit a little and it goes in your eye, you could get AIDS. Or if they were sweating and you touched them, you could get AIDS. Or if you shook their hand. So nobody knew anything. It was just, there was no information. And Ronald Reagan came into power at that point, and he didn't want to deal with AIDS for the first two years of his office, um, his administration. So it just really affected the whole scene. And uh, those three things, in my opinion, really accounted for you know, shutting down, or changing, I should say, the, uh, the whole disco world that I knew. Um, real quickly, what happened was these pictures ended up in a box somewhere, and uh, they ran in the Village Voice once in a while, but basically I just put them away in, in like 1979. And in about 2003, I got a call from a guy named David Hill in London who was a music producer, and he said, did you do these pictures of disco? And I said, yeah, and he said, well, there's a renewed interest in this period, would you like to do a coffee table book? So I said, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so he found a publisher, Real Art Press in London, and, and Tony Norman, the publisher, and David and I started putting this book together. And um, I was, re this was 2015, I realized as we were doing this that it became crystal clear to me you know, like what I had here. Um, because in 2015, the Equal Marriage Amendment uh, passed. Um, the flag, the Confederate flag came down in the South. Uh, transgenders were allowed in, in uh, the military. And it's like there was this sea change during that year of sort of cultural awareness and acceptance and inclusion. And I thought to myself, like what I captured here was really like the beginning, you know? Like it was like a small microcosm of, of the world that we're just beginning to see today. And I sort of feel that, you know, in cultural movements like this that you take two steps forward and one step backward. And I think we might be taking a step backward right now a little bit. <laughs> But I believe in my heart that inclusion and acceptance is a natural way of, of, of being as a human being. And and I think we're gonna move forward in, the, in our culture again. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hello, folks. Hi, my name is Alice Eccles. I teach at the University of Southern California. And I wrote a book back in 2010 called Hot Stuff, a Disco in the Remaking of American Culture. And I, I first of all want to thank uh, the incredibly competent uh, staff here at the Library of Congress. They've just been terrific. Um, I would like to linger for a moment on what I consider to be the irony of this event. Um, an event that really frankly seemed highly, would have seemed highly unlikely until I think just even about 10 years ago. I mean the idea that the Library of Congress would be staging this event, unthinkable. You see, for those of you who are too young to remember this, disco really was not meant to be the subject of books and films and conferences where participants would grapple with its meanings and its effects. You know, disco was supposed to have been buried some 36 years ago. And it's actually true that by 1981, all across America, radio stations were ditch ditching 
disco in favor of really anything else, any other format. In very many places across the country, actual disco started to shut down to be replaced by anything else. In 1981, the Grammy Awards dropped its short-lived disco category after having grudgingly just established it. <laughs> Gloria Gaynor's I Will Survive remains the only record to have been awarded the best disco recording, which it won in 1980. And that was that. Record labels also went about shutting down their disco divisions if they had ones. And soon, the record jackets of those club singles that your DJ, if you went to a disco, that your DJ played changed as well. And, and I remember this very clearly because I was a DJ in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Yay! <laughs> so gone were the drawings of platform shoes and all those other signifiers of disco, and instead they were replaced by graphics that were supposed to conjure up new wave. And really, so complete was disco's banishment from the mainstream that it had to be rebranded, and henceforth, henceforth it became known as dance music. But a funny thing happened on the way to the musical graveyard. Disco, well, disco persisted. That's, thank you, thank you for that. <laughs> yes. This new dance music employed, some of it, a less predictable beat than the 4x4 four four thump. But it sounded an awful lot like disco. Some of the biggest artists of the 1980s, Madonna, Prince, Michael Jackson, cut disco tracks, even if their record companies studiously avoided ever calling it disco. And fast forward to today, and you tell me that Lord's green light doesn't bear a distinct debt to disco. So, you know, disco continues to exact its revenge through contemporary music and through events like this. Now today, I want to focus on some of the cultural work that disco did. But before I get into the specifics, I want to note that there is in fact a paradox that I think is at the heart of disco. And that paradox is this. Disco, in its classical period, was lyrically very slight. You know, even partisans of disco could not argue that its lyrics were especially meaningful. You know, get down tonight, boogie down. And yet, disco packed a real cultural and social wallop. That's the paradox. That it did, to me, suggests that sometimes music that isn't explicitly political, music that might even strike some as trite, can nevertheless do political work. Take, for example, Sister Sledge's We Are Family, a track that ignited dance floors. Believe me, it was the song that could always, was guaranteed to get people out on the dance floor. But it also was the song that kept Nelson Mandela going when he was in prison. Now, I'm not knocking um, songs such as Ohio by Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young or Public Enemies, Black Steel, but I am saying that a song need not be overtly political to get people feeling, moving, and even thinking differently. And I think what disco offers us is a case study of the ways that music can be usefully understood as a social process. Through it, we learn, in fact, how to experience our own feelings, our own desires, and sometimes even our own bodies. And this is why, when thinking about music, it's important to acknowledge that music not only reflects what's happening politically, culturally, and socially, it also enacts change. And speaking of change, I want to turn to this first slide. Um, here, I have quoted Nona Hendricks, who was the songwriter, and yes, Nona, <laughs> who was a member of Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells and was the person uh, within that group who was perhaps most strongly in favor of converting that group, transforming it into LaBelle, 
which recorded the 1974 hit Lady Marmalade. Um, and here she is talking about the group's transformation from a conventional girl group into um, something far less conventional, <laughs> much more chaotic and wild and anarchic. Um, but I think that the same could be say, said about the ways that disco affected particular populations of listeners and dancers. And let's just hear a little bit of Lady Marmalade, if we could. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're talking about Beyonce's feminism, which I think is a great topic, you have to give, um, I think, um, credit due to, um, to Nona Hendricks and Chaka Khan. You have to give props to, to really, both to Nona Hendricks and to Chaka Khan because they really are among the most important black feminist voices of the 1970s. Um, now, there are other people that I have put up here. This is... <laughs> Grace Jones, model turned disco performer. Monty Rock the Third, The wink wink, nod nod, homosexual personality who was on TV. Um, a fair amount, and who fronted an early disco group, this being the disco group, and was also the DJ in Saturday Night Fever. You know, actually, Sylvester was a reluctant disco star. He really didn't like disco, at least initially. Um, and then, of course, the village people. And this was before the village people were quite so processed um, and quite so predictable. Now, I focused here in these slides on disco artists who are indeed uh, really more unconventional. But it's important to acknowledge that, you know, a lot of critics um, and listeners thought that disco was regressive, um, actually. I mean, disco was attacked for both being too gay and too straight, too black and too white oversexed and asexual, leisure class and leisure suited working class, as in Tony Monero of Saturday Night Fever. And so disco, for the person who's trying to understand it, make sense of it, it represented anything but a stable signifier. Um, it was really a moving target. Um, now how can that be? How is that possible? Well, in my book, Hot Stuff, um, which I, I called Hot Stuff for several reasons, one of which was that there were these two sort of bookend disco songs, one by the Stones and the other by Donna Summer. Um, but I also called it Hot Stuff because I wanted to explore disco's hotness, its upending of America's racial rules and gender and sexual conventions. And in the book I argue that disco broadened the contours, the contours of identity in three areas. First of all, Disco evolved out of the work of African-American musicians and producers who were experimenting with lavish, sophisticated arrangements that, that broke, in some cases, with some of the conventions of soul music. So much so that some critics and listeners thought that disco didn't sound recognizably soulful or even black. Secondly, male homosexuality shifted with disco. In the disco years, gay men became newly visible, largely through the dissemination of disco culture. Their self-presentation also shifted as effeminacy, and this is a key point, effeminacy begins to give away 
more fully to a macho style recognizable to anyone who has ever glimpsed the village people. And here's the third thing that shifted. Feminism's critique, because remember the 1970s is also the decade of second wave feminism. Feminism's critique of three minute sex, heterosexual sex. I shouldn't have to explain that, but um, feminism's critique of three minute sex found its voice in disco. This played itself out in especially important ways with black female performers who broke with really long standing represent representational strategies that were rooted in respectability. I mean, long before Madonna put on those breastplates, you know, um, this had already been done in La Belle by Sarah Dash in the center. Think of when you're thinking about representations of respectability and, and, and a, a kind of obsession with respectability, which is entirely understandable given our country's history. Nonetheless, think of Motown and think of the girl groups in their gowns and their white gloves. And so when I think about disco, one of the things that I think is important about it is that the only way that you can make sense of how we get from Diana Ross in the 1960s to Little Kim in the 90s is to take on board how disco validated female desire, perhaps most famously with Donna Summer's Love to Love You Baby. I don't know what all that noise is that's out there. Um, okay, so these changes that I've outlined were experienced as liberating by some, but they were also controversial. Was disco a repudiation of racial profiling of sorts? Or was it turning R&B music beige? Was it transmogrifying it into, a, as one critic put it, a mush of vacuous music? And what about the new gay macho? Was it best understood as a parody or as a mimicking of conventional heterosexuality, of conventional heterosexual masculinity? Was it liberating in its rejection of the age-old association of homosexuality with effeminacy? Or was it regressive in its stigmatizing of sissiness? And what about women? Disco filled the air with what one singer called women's love rights. But this happened in a context in which the social and legal policy that would ensure a more level playing field for women lagged way behind the sexual revolution. Indeed, disco's promotion of greater sexual expressiveness seemed to, some to, seemed to some people to run the risk of exacerbating women's sexual vulnerability. And certainly it has to be said that disco would not really, I think, prove to be any more conducive to the empowerment of female performers than any other pop music genre. And here I'm talking about the working conditions. So I said I wanted to talk in more specific terms about the cultural work performed by disco. And I want to now turn to the relationship of gay men in particular to disco. Even before disco became disco, gay male sociability and subjectivity were beginning to shift as queer nightlife began to register the reverberations of the 1960s. These reverberations first registered above ground in funky bars rather than in exclusive, unmarked clubs visible only by the lines of people queued outside in front of them. Indeed, the bar where these reverberations were perhaps most keenly felt was a sleazy, mafia-run dive in New York City called the Stonewall Inn, the site of the famous Stonewall Rebellion of June 1969, which is said by many, and it's Many, many historians would agree that it kick-started the gay liberation movement in America. Now, scholars have puzzled over the Stonewall Uprising, that it happened when it did, and that it seemed to trigger this big movement. Some historians have argued that by the time of the rebellion, there was already what was called a homophile movement that had been active for almost two decades with Frank Kameny, who was a DC activist, being uh, a leading figure in it. And research has shown that, indeed, sexual minorities had taken to the streets before Stonewall. Um, 
in one case in LA at a bar not far from where I live. Others have argued that if gays and lesbians were open to movement making in 69, it was because of their participation in bar culture, which had for decades put them on the front lines of everyday resistance. Now, I want to make a different but related argument, and it's that what went on outside the Stonewall Inn on those June nights some 48 years ago built on changes already underway inside the Stonewall Inn. Now, the Stonewall was a gay dancing bar, which as late as 1969, that is at the height of the 60s, was unusual in New York. Most of the city's gay male bars did not permit dancing, while the Stonewall actually had two dance floors. Testimonies from Stonewall regulars suggest that the bar's dance floors, particularly the room in the back, which was frequented by African-American and Puerto Rican street kids undermined the sexual indirection and repression that characterized, most other, that characterized most other gay bars. In that room, in that back room, Judy Garland was already passe. She was already a thing of the past as soul music blared on their jukebox. And the dancing there was not sedate. One of the many young street queens who frequented the Stonewall argued that the culture that existed in the back room fostered the articulation of gay desire. He said at other gay bars, you know, you could look across the, you could look across the room, you could see a sexy guy, you could fantasize about getting involved, but, you know, you couldn't go over and ask him to dance. Another regular at the bar credits the Stonewall with making him confront his own sexual uptightness and internalized homophobia. So the Stonewall was itself a site of transformation, one that was forging a stronger connection between going out and coming out. It was also forging a relationship between commercialized leisure and gay, what would become gay liberation, an association that disco would build upon. Now, by the time music writer Vincelletti wrote about what he called party music, party music and discotheque rock in the fall of 73 in Rolling Stone magazine, gay men had been dancing in discos for three years. It would take another year before, before Billboard magazine began keeping track of hot dance clubs, as it called it, cuts, as it called it and two more before the majors began to take the music seriously. When one considers the context in which gay disco took shape, one in which dancing had been restricted, had been surveilled, had really been illicit, you know, it's nearly impossible to disaggregate dancing from politics. Even if there had been no instances of DJs leading dancers off the dance floor and into the streets to protest, and this, by the way, actually happened in 1971 in New York City, dancing still constituted an act of defiance for gay men and lesbians. Now, gay disco amplified the shift towards greater sexual straightforwardness, which in tandem with gay liberation would change bar culture radically. It would also change gay sociability and gay male subjectivity, how they understood themselves as the shift away from effeminacy to macho accelerated. How did disco participate in this shift? Well, first, nonstop music. In a disco, silence was not tolerated, which was why disco featured those very clever segues that fooled you into thinking that you were dancing to the last song, not the new one. Seamless music signaled, I think, a break with the past a break with those nights when a flashlight or a red light and the police brought the music and the dancing to a very abrupt halt. The volume and the sheer relentlessness of this music obliterated shyness and inhibitions. And a good disco sound system which emphasized the music's thunderous bass was like, as one person put it, an audio orgasmatron. <laughs> And the sweatbox conditions of many discos ushered in the era of Nautilus, with the result that gay men, gay men began fashioning their bodies into what art critic Douglas Crimp called dancing machines. The owner of one of Manhattan's trendiest gay bars 
was himself gay and a gym enthusiast. And he claims, although I don't think he's entirely right, to have engineered the practice of dancing bare-chested. And I quote, there was no AC, and I made sure the windows were closed so it would heat up. They had to take off their shirts. <laughs> now this practice of dancing half-naked uh, quickly spread. Okay, so this buff body, it was about style, but it was critical to the reconfiguring of gay identity and desire. Before, gay men had been, as one person put it, gay clubber Mel Charon, hunters after the same prey, rather than allies or prospective partners. Now, gay men, rather than heterosexual men, became the embodiment of covetable, desirable masculinity and the fantasized object of desire for one another. We're brothers, was the feeling, recalled novelist Edmund White. We're the men we've been looking for. We're the men we've been looking for, not the trade that might beat you up. Now, I think the macho turn is one of the most significant and least studied shifts in 20th century gay history. Um, in his novel, Faggots, Larry Kramer, um, or the, this is his novel, but the narrator in it ponders the possibility that the macho look has taken hold because it's a way of hiding or homogenizing. On the other hand, it also occurs to him that maybe it's a send up and a turn on. And I would argue gay macho operated in, in multiple registers with its meaning shifted, shifting according to context. The author of a very wonderful blog, New York City, Not Kansas, concedes that gay macho could be silly in and of itself. But he argues that as a consequence of this shift, gay men seem to behave more decently toward each other. Now that what he identified, and I'm quoting, as effeminacy and corrosive bitchiness, end quote, which had been so much a part of camp sensibility, were waning. Others agree and point to macho as liberating for the way that it challenged this automatic association of homosexuality with effeminacy. But macho had its critics. Even at the time, a number of gay writers questioned whether the normalization of homosexuality was being achieved through the continued stigmatization of effeminacy. Edmund White warned our old fears of sissiness still with us, though masked by what he called the new macho fascism, are now located, quarantined through our, through our persecution of the transvestite. So if homosexuality was destigmatized in these years to some extent, it was at the expense, some would argue, of effeminacy, which was disavowed to such an extent that the drag queens who were on the front lines that June at the Stonewall were relegated to the far margins of the movement. And even Sylvester, when he would go to a gay club, would sometimes face, when they didn't know him, harassment for the way that he looked. The macho turn did prove daunting to effeminate gay men, particularly drag queens who, in the post-Stonewall 70s, found themselves shoved to the very sidelines of gay life. Even gay's camp style the identification with tragic doomed women like Judy Garland, the obsession with Broadway musicals, which suggested, as literary critic D.A. Miller argues, that transcendence lay in the strength to endure a depressive status quo. That no longer had the same resonance now that gay masculinity no longer signaled failed masculinity. And this shift sidelined, as I said, whole categories of gay existence. Um, as many people came to seem antique in this new world. It's worth noting that this macho turn was completely unanticipated by gay liberationists <laughs> who thought that the future was androgyny. Dennis Altman, a prominent gay writer and activist, said, our biggest failure was an inability to foresee the extent to which a new gay culture would emerge that would build on existing male-female differences. Another unanticipated result of disco has to do with class and race. Now, 
no doubt, subcultures tend toward the tribal. And the culture of gay disco was no exception. I think scholars in general have been far too ready to buy into the idea that gay disco constituted entirely the sort of democratic Eden. Um, but it is clear that, to me at least, that A-list gay discos, um, those that required a good amount of money to join, um, had a, a, a problematic effect. Um, I mean, it could be very difficult to get past the doorman in certain clubs. Um, for instance, close to impossible if you were a woman. Even Bette Midler was denied a membership at one of the <laughs> most prominent gay clubs in New York. Um, throughout the 70s and beyond, gay newspapers were often filled with stories of discrimination at discos. Um, so, you know, at the same time that there was this sense of brotherly love, as I've indicated, it had a distinct downturn, which was the pull towards a greater class and racial homogeneity, which in tandem with gentrification, something you guys know a lot about here in DC, made for gay clubs that were increase, increasingly segmented along class and race lines. So the racial and class crossings that for, had for so long characterized gay communities, and bracket this, read George Chauncey's Gay New York if you doubt it, that began to fade. Something else I think that gay liberationists didn't get quite right was the relationship of new gay communities to commerce. As it happened, the beneficiary of gay liberation's cry out of the closets and into the street was not so much gay liberation and the, and the movement around it. It was the discos and bathhouses that emerged that really became the kind of glue for community. Um, now, despite discos, that possible downside, again, that can be debated, the commercialism of disco culture, it was nonetheless through disco that gay men of the 70s charted a course that really permitted them to feel sexually legible to each other, to reject the prevailing construction of gay masculinity as defective. It was on the disco dance floor, surging with energy of so many bodies becoming one, that gay men created an alternate sexual subjectivity and a powerful feeling of solidarity. This may, this, what I'm gonna say might seem counterintuitive, but the hedonistic promiscuity, which certainly characterized gay disco, seems to have actually enabled communal aspiration, as Michael Warner has argued, rather than impeding it. One sees this in the years when gay men began to fall sick and die of AIDS. Those dance floor communities that had been building for years became for many gay men with HIV their real support community. And I'm going to end here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi. I hope everyone's getting excited for the rest of today. Uh, there's a lot of awesome stuff going on. And uh, we really appreciate your being here throughout the symposium for Biblio Discotech. Uh, my name is Nicholas Brown. I'm one of the producers of the series. Uh, I work in the music division here at the library. I come from a uh, conductor, French horn player, singer, musicologist, arts administrator kind of pedigree. And uh, it's uh, with great pleasure that uh, we are all gathering here on stage to do a bit of a, a discussion and then open it up uh, for your questions. And uh, we, of course, have Martin and Alice and Bill back on stage who have given us some wonderful lectures this afternoon, giving a really uh, a range of the different elements that go into dance culture uh, from the disco era and also in more contemporary settings. Uh, so I'd like to just start by asking you, where is disco now compared to where it was 10 years ago in terms of cultural memory? In terms of cultural memory? Mm -hmm. Oh, I think, I think everything has changed. I mean, 
One of the things that, that I was very struck by when I um, first began writing about disco, I think it was 1994, I published an article in the LA Weekly. And oh my goodness, <laughs> some of the letters to the editor were, were so vicious. I, I, I was shocked. Um, and I was used to disco haters. I mean, disco, although I was a DJ in Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor was a punk town. It wasn't a disco town. And those lines were very much drawn in the 1970s and 80s. Um, when my book came out in 2010, it was an entirely different environment because young people, for the most part, they don't know about discophobia. They don't know about the time when disco had been the biggest cultural joke of the 20th century, right? So I think everything has shifted, and of course, disco permeates popular music. I mean, there's disco, as I was saying, disco never died. <laughs> so I, I think it's a, it, I, you know, I think it's entirely different now. I mean, it, it, to answer you fully would be um, take much too much time, but I think it is true that in some sense the, the culture wars in, in the US, um, people usually focus on abortion, um, let's say affirmative action, but I think the ERA in the 1970s and beyond, I think that disco was very much a part of those culture wars. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin, could you share some of the sort of more international perspective on American disco and then the divergence with other countries' kind of disco cultures and how they're similar or how they're different? Yeah, and especially in relation to the contemporary question. Um, because I think a, a strong point you make is that even though the semiotics around disco change, and then uh, partly out of perhaps some embarrassment about its you know, apparently sort of motoric character and so on, um, and then these associations with you know, gay subcultures and so on, which, uh, it, which help to uh, um, marginalize it as a kind of a, a movement, but uh, uh, then that becomes sort of transformed into the more palatable kind of dance music. Now, we can't even imagine the last 30, 40 years without dance music being front and center. Uh, whether it's, uh, you know, um, it, 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 whether that's trance music, house music, or however this is all, be, or garage music and on and on, the genres pl proliferate in some sense, but it was disco in some, in some ways that provided that foundational moment for all of that. Um, and in, uh, just of the folks that I mentioned in my presentation, um, thinking of, uh, I might have lost the sound. Yeah, it's, yeah. Did I lose some? Um, but uh, the folks that I mentioned in my presentation, um, such as the Kwaito music in South Africa today, which is really something as a post-apartheid kind of uh, music that is run on automated digital machinery, which I think is a very important component of disco, by the way, is the, is the technologies that came into the mainstream at that point. The TR-33 drum machine, for example, right, as being somehow a place in which you could now organize rhythms um, using a different um, way of interfacing with your machines. It was no longer that embodied kind of um, work being done, usually by a white male heterosexual drummer with all of that expressive apparatus. Now you had a drum machine um, in, in South Africa, this Kwaito music um, is, is, is one of the first musics to which you can now purely dance, like those um, pansulas were doing, and the music um, auto-generates uh, in some ways. Um, and it's been, you know, a, a sort of feedback loop between continents produced that. So it's a house music, but slowed down this time. And, um, you know, it's, it's understood to be a kind of slowed down garage house music that is itself ricocheting with American elements um, and then being re-Africanized and re-creolized in these other spaces. The, the only thing that I would add is that early disco, however, al although disco was <laughs> always attacked as plastic music for plastic people, I mean, that was one of the criticisms that was made. I mean, early disco did not use synthesizers or drum machines. Um, that does develop, but in the early years, it wasn't a feature of it. They used full orchestras. Question for Bill uh, is, <clears throat> how is kind of the disco era and the disco culture uh, differentiated in how it is portrayed in uh, still and moving images since the era? Like, has there been an evolution in terms of like how the film 54 was, you know, portraying Studio 54 in the culture? or other, you know, the marketing for the pure disco CDs from the 90s? Yeah, well, I haven't seen the movie mm -hmm. 54, um, but there's, there's a TV show called The Get Down, mm -hmm. um, which is a disco, you know, based um, show. And 
I watched about two or three episodes, and I basically couldn't watch it anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just so it's so packaged for commercial TV, and you know, it it's um, you know, it it had some of the elements of of the disco that I remember, but it was um, you know, that particular time was so unique, um, and you know, like I said before, you know, there were so many factors that contributed to that, you know, perfect storm that, you know, you can't really, you can't do that again, mm -hmm. for example. I mean, you couldn't create a disco again um, just because those, it's a different time, you know, and, and um, the issues are different, you know, people are different. Um, so I haven't seen anything like currently, you know, that really captures the essence of what I saw uh, during that period. Um, one question for all of you, which is going to be very thematic to the Library of Congress, of course, and I'm a librarian too, so. Uh, what is the role of libraries, archives, and museums in, in terms of um, providing access to the research that can happen and discovery that can happen about an era or a musical movement such as disco? Uh, and is there a significance that, you know, the Library of Congress is programming disco? Does that do something for the study of disco? Uh, or is it more important that uh, local public libraries are doing something related to it? I don't know. I'd just like to open the floor on that kind of topic. Well, I, I would love to have it happening at all levels. Uh, I think it's wonderful that the Library Congress has put this event on. I, I just think it's terrific. But I mean, I know in my own research, um, um, what was really important to me was going to England actually, mm. and um, uh, using using some libraries in England where I was able to look at the music press, um, because the music press in Britain actually was much more sympathetic to this new sound than, let's say, Rolling Stone or some of the American music press. So, just in my own research, it was it was really important. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. I haven't, um, I don't do archival work in disco, but um, uh, from, you know, from the project I, um, uh, I alluded to today in my presentation, I, I'm, I'm looking at the global biography of rhythmic uh, sounds and so on, and um, uh, particularly emanating from Africa and then taking up residency within dance musical forms in the West and also uh, right across through to classical music forms. So that's broadly speaking where my project is. Um, to find out anything about how this actually happens historically, I have been utterly dependent on libraries, mainly in Europe uh, as well, but also here, um, that uh, you know, indicate what kinds of contact was there, what were the ethnographic transcriptions, when did who travel where, what letters were written between an ethnographer or between a composer and, say, um, an African ethno ethnographer and so on, and the, the movement of tape and cassette and vinyl and computers, um, all of these media that carry imprints of what might have happened. I mean, Alice is a historian, which is, uh, you know, so she'll know the true predicament here, but reconstructing history is, is uh, a no mean feat. Uh, it gets forgotten, even if it is assumed by some of us that have lived through certain periods, it, it really uh, leaves, it needs to leave traces and documents. And um, uh, I think libraries are essential, even if they don't seem like very populated spaces, it takes that special researcher to really bring it back mm -hmm. uh, to us. So um, uh, libraries have been essential. Um, the only thing I can comment on that is that there was an article in um, German Rolling Stone mm -hmm. um, in November uh, and uh, I had it translated by my German friend, and they used pictures from my book to illustrate it. And the writer described how back in the early Nazi days, um, there was uh, kind of a, what was the disco of, of today in the sense that the youth who were maybe politically apathetical, um, or apolitical, um, you know, they would meet sort of underground and uh, they would dance. And it was kind of a rebellion sort of thing, but they would, they would do that and then they would talk a little bit about, you know, what we're gonna do and the politics and things that were going on. But it was really like 
a celebration of just being not part of what was happening in the world. It was like a, you know, a private event. Mm -hmm. So he was trying to sort of trace back uh, you know, what happened in New York to that early you know, 1939 era. Cool. And I, I would <laughs> say also, just, just to add this, I mean, since the early adopters of disco music were a marginalized, marginalized groups, it's, it's especially important that we, that we have documentation. Mm -hmm. And it makes it especially difficult, too. So how would you document your DJ sets if you were to do it all over again? That would be easy, actually. Yeah? Yeah, very easy. <coughs> it's not like difficult. Do you use SoundCloud or that type of well, thing? Well, no, I mean, I don't myself. I mean, <laughs> believe me, I, <laughs> I hardly have the time. But um, I have um, some of those sets that are written down. Mm. And I had uh, beats per minute charts, mm. you know, and so and I didn't do this for a very long time. It was only for a few years. And so I have a pretty good sense of what I would segue. And then I, I also practiced a lot and because I was not a natural born mixer, all right? So making that segue from one song to the next, which in those years was so critical, you know? Yeah. You really had to do it seamlessly. Um, uh, you know, I practiced a lot and I would make tapes for friends. And so I still have some of those tapes. So I have a pretty good sense of what I was doing. And uh, with your photography, how do you archive it for yourself? Or do you even, well, you have to do that because or else you're not going to be disseminating it, right? You have to have it organized and such. But are yeah. you thinking about it in this, the archival sense of long term where it's going to go? Or is, or is it just the working kind of archive? Well, it's a body of work that is, you know, now complete, obviously. Um, and, you know, the book um, that, I, that was produced, the disco, the Bill Bernstein photographs, is a volume of that work. Um, and it was trying to cover as much as we could in a, you know, a short space. I have four or 500 rolls of film that I shot during that time period. And there's probably two or three other volumes that could be wow. you know, produced from there. But, um, and they would have different feelings to them, you know, different, um, you know, uh, covering different subject matter. Um, but it's all just, um, it's all just, you know, on my computer at this point. And um, I do get requests from different people for different purposes, um, you know, articles and pieces. Do, do you have a picture of um, Le Club? You know, uh, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's just sitting there at this point. I wanted to um, just add something, since we're talking about documentation and archives and so on, and um, the challenge that the archive presents and <clears throat> non-archive, um, just to amplify your point in relation to some of the work that I'm doing, which is um, not just marginalized communities, but to some extent, you know, in geographically remote spaces, mm -hmm. sometimes involving mu musical traditions that are withering mm -hmm. and uh, don't have a, a record. It doesn't have a history of, for example, documentation by notation, but other right. modes of transmission right. um, that were not the same, sometimes more effective than notation. This isn't saying notation is better. It's just a different kind of document that survives a few more days of time. But um, that, that, that challenge is, um, is, is an, a, you know, um, another layer, particularly if you're trying to access deep history. So, if, for example, with, the, with some of the patterns that I was tracing, um, if you look at the Wikipedia page or the blogosphere or the, the mainstream media or the, the big media, I call it mainstream, it's gone, become a strange word to use now, but um, the way in which the, the stories of these big songs is narrated is you know, full, of, full of information. I mean, you know, so we experience ourselves as being in an information age, cornucopia all over, mm -hmm. and yet there's a primitive path making of redundancy, and it's kind of got a short term memory, uh, often 15 years or so. Mm -hmm. So on the Beyonce page, for example, you won't be able to find, or on the the fan-generated Wikipedia page for that song, you won't be able to find um, that many references that go beyond um, DJ um, the Major Lazer. After that, you have to start to do additional work. Mm -hmm. And you can't just enter it on the Wikipedia page because it'll throw you off, unless, of course, you're a scholar and you take the time to. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got its rules. And then you particularly cannot get all the way to Africa because at this point, um, 
uh, most, uh, most of that information is just not known, even by the protagonists producing the music. And so you have a, a really deep challenge. You know, this, uh, uh, the other day I was talking at, uh, um, in this institution about, about some of this in relation to the mathematics practices in Southern Africa, many of which were wiped out um, as they happened. So to keep your authority, say, when you were drawing up Tusuna um, ideographs in Angola, um, you would, after the lesson, wipe out the record so that you could sustain your authority. In the West, we have copyright to sustain that copyright, emerging at the time the paper emerges. So um, different rules of the game across the globe means that the challenges of the archive are, you know, are real. And as we move into a, a global era where the copyright um, um, regime is in some sense the dominant one. We need, to, we need to do some serious reconstructing works, and so we're really dependent on, again, the archives. That you gave me a perfect segue there. Um, the Library of Congress is, of course, the home of the U.S. Copyright Office, and so many of our popular music holdings are a result of the copyright registration process, where we, for example, have the copyright deposit of uh, I Will Survive, or other things like that, uh, and going back to the late uh, 1870s. In your unique kind of professional worlds, at least in relation to each other, um, what is the important role of copyright and how does it differ, um, perhaps based on the mediums that you're seeking? So like Alice, if you're sampling, a, and I'm sorry to go back to the DJ thing, but if you're sampling as a DJ, how cognizant are you of the copyright situation for that? Or for Bill, when you are managing your uh, collection of photographs, um, are you very flexible with fair use for academic institutions or is it something that you really stick close to? Mm. And then for Martin, um, where do maybe y you face some barriers with uh, copyright for your own scholarship? I don't know. You don't have to answer those. You can just kind of jump on copyright wherever. <clears throat> well, copyright's really important for photography. Yeah. Um, and uh, even, even copyright, um, it, it doesn't protect people from using my images, you know, especially with the internet. I mean, that's the big problem for me. Um, all the images that I have in this body of work for, for um, disco are copyrighted through the Library of Congress, but I also have the software program that shows me who in the world is using images. And it's astonishing, like all over the world, you know, announcing some club opening, there'll be one of my pictures, wow. you know, like Larry LeVan, you know. Um, so, you know, there's not much that I can do about it. Um, the way I see it, if it's being used for a real commercial money-making um, usage, then I can actually go after them, you know, and, um, you know, let them know that they either have to take it down or they have to pay me something. But um, copywriting, uh, I know that there's been some changes in terms of photographic copywriting lately. and. Uh, I'm not really up on it, but I know it's become much more difficult, and it's become much different, you know, harder for photographers, and I would like to see that sort of eased mm -hmm. down. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, copyright, uh, I mean, f it's been decades since I was teaching, you know, so, I mean, I, I guess that, for, you know, I've had, um, problems when I've been writing books, whether it's about Janis Joplin or about disco, uh, getting um, the ability to, to quote um, lyrics. And, and obviously, you know, in today's world, you cannot quote very much. Um, and that's kind of a drag. On the other hand, you know, as somebody who writes, you know, uh, it, it pains me when I go online and I see that somebody has downloaded my whole book, mm -hmm. you know? whether it's the Janus book or the Disco book or another book, and it's like, wow, can't we do anything about this? Well, maybe for a week, but you know, it'll come back up. Yeah. So, uh, copyright, you know? Uh. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm gonna switch the question a little bit to the content of some of the work rather than the problems I've encountered, which are similar to both of you, really. Um, and I think that this is one of the central issues of our time, is uh, we have a kind of micro-economy, 
which is uh, deeply sort of fueled by new technologies um, in music p exacerbated by what one might call the MP3 effect after mm -hmm. Napster, which means the, the, the um, genie of the commodity form got out of the bottle in some ways and became free. Mm -hmm. And we have paradoxically now in a period of time where uh, the, the commodity, the debased, rational, segmented musical sounds are in a sense free and it's the concerts that have become very expensive. So sort of everything's gone experiential. So that, you know, uh, a, a huge increase in prices in uh, in, in music concert uh, watching and so on. Because and that's how artists can make their money. That's now. right. It's right. The only so, the, way so we, we have can these make inverted relations, and in a way, we've been sent back to the 18th century, um, because uh, in a sort of pre-copyright age, where now you have to become the troubadour on the street mm -hmm. again. And this is a, a fascinating problem. Now, if we take something like again the work that I presented, there's a number of serious copyright issues that emerge. And that is, you know, many artists being used along the way. It's a corporate collaborative endeavor, which is standard practice in the industry, um, you know. And yet, very often, the authors are not the ones that are necessarily um, um, properly uh, uh, monetized in that arrangement. So you have, you know, Tofu Tofu, or you have, um, in this case, Peter Hugo, uh, a photographer, mm -hmm. right, who makes an appearance in this work, very, um, very, important one, or, you know, Messi Mia in formation, or uh, Big Fridia and so on. Well, Messi Mia, who most people are less aware of as a, you know, a queer trans figure from, uh, uh, from New Orleans. So again, Beyonce doing this amazing social work in a way by drawing attention to these intense and beautiful and powerful subcultures from footwork to bounce. Um, but at the same time, the sample of the voice um, is left um, unmonetized. And so mm -hmm. you have this sort of deference, but at the same time, the political economy um, undercuts a little bit or cuts very much against the grain of the deeper message um, of, those, um, of those songs. So Diplo, for example, in the song that I presented, mm -hmm. was paid as a, or credited as mm -hmm. a co-writer. But Diplo didn't start there, and that's why I was giving you the palimpsestic layers. And the irony is that everybody that was not the artist got a piece of the pie, but the true artists uh, mm -hmm. at the source, if you like, and there's always a source behind the source, but we can push it always a little further, doesn't get monetized. So this respect for you know, it, it, the proper demands of the author concept um, is, is um, very often um, in, a, in, in, in a crisis today, and we feel it. Uh, the Copyright Office uh, has put together a, a really fun uh, thing, which is a, a web page dedicated to uh, exploring copyright through disco. And it's at copyright.gov slash disco. Uh, that's, I think that's pretty awesome. Uh, and uh, y you can explore the catalog, uh, copyright.gov, to you know, see what types of registrations came in, see that Gloria Gaynor did not write I Will Survive, and that kind of business. Uh, and uh, tonight, if you're coming to the event, you'll have the opportunity to get a very quick and fun introduction to copyright at one of the photo booths, <laughs> which is going to be really cool. So you'll get a printout of your photo, and there's this little folder that tells you the basics about the copyright process and how important it is to creators, um, and, and in the hope of you know, making us all more aware of that, that process. So before we open up to q and I'd like to ask you all one more question, and it might be one of those annoying questions, but... Where do you see disco's reception in 10 years compared to where we're at now? <laughs> Sigh. <laughs> well, I, I, th I think, you know, certainly one of the things that I found fascinating about what's happened, uh, you know, you started this out by talking about the cultural memory around disco. And I think that uh, certainly one of the things that I was struck by as I was writing my book was the extent to which disco, which again had been treated as a kind of um, joke in its time, had become for both queer artists and artists who are some, in some respects allies, right? I mean, I think of everybody from the Pet Shop Boys to Lady Gaga and beyond, um, that disco had become understood not as a... Mm, a kind of regressive political and musical move, but rather as transgressive uh, because of its associations with gay liberation and, and this real break with the past, a past of repression. Um, it's very, I think it's very hard to know what the future is um, and how disco is 
um, going to be understood 10 years down the line, but I do think that probably this vilification and demonization of disco is probably behind us. Great. I think that, um, I don't know that, you know, the uh, perception of disco from, from that era is ever gonna really change. Um, I, I think it is what it is, but I think that the music itself has evolved, certainly. I mean, after New York, it went to Chicago and became house music and uh, went to Detroit, you know, it's EDM. Um, and I think what, what happened in my case was um, in early 2000, um, this record producer who produces, um, you know, e what's contemporary, you know, EDM music, all of a sudden these younger people realize that like, wait a minute, this comes from disco, you know? So I think that there's a, there's a new respect for disco in a sense um, as being the source of a lot of the you know, new, new music that's out there today. And um, yeah, I think that's changed a little bit of, of the, um, you know, uh, the feeling of, of um, you know, the kind of silliness of what we you know, think of as disco back then. But I think it's evolved. Mm -hmm. I think it's just about evolution. Martin, do you have any thoughts? I mean, aside from the um, recurring kind of um, retro tropes, right, you know, the ever, re ever reappearing ABBA or something like that, you know, the, um, in fact, Jaron Lanier speaks about um, music history as having becoming retro, 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 that it all just looks back and, and picks up pieces, and he, he's not um, uh, excited about that. He thinks it's, you know, eating on the seed stock of culture and so on, a debate. But, um, but I think I would take the line that, um, that has been suggested by both of the previous speakers in the following sense that I think, in some sense, disco kind of won out um, in the way that you know, it emerged and flourished into these multiple dance forms. And mm -hmm. if we look at the musical techniques used, like the shaping and shifting of time, the flattening of, or, of, of, of harmonic space, uh, it's such that you, um, in some sense, undercut the functional principle of chords moving in uh, traditional ways. Um, think Donna Summer, right? The extended space, the uh, sidling up effect of that, what was once a hi-hat in between in the offbeat, that then became a gigantic synth, that then became a dominant sound of, you know, mainstream uh, 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 dance music, as well as EDM and IDM and all of these other offshoots. So I think in terms of the grammar, we actually, find that's a pivotal moment that in some sense one could argue generated an afterlife that is much bigger than it and in some ways the question of its, uh, pre, uh, of its um, uh, focal point uh, as a historical um, you know, uh, uh, emanating moment I think is, is, is hard to contest. Mm. Excellent. Yeah, I mean I think it really did shift pop music, musical architecture in, in very important ways and I suspect it's going to continue to have an influence. I, I, there's nothing to indicate that this is changing anytime soon. Fascinating. Well, uh, the time is here for you to ask the experts, so to speak. Um, there are microphones at the front of the aisle on either side. If you wouldn't mind just walking up to the microphone uh, and sharing your question. And as soon as you, as, you, as soon as you have asked your question, you're free to return to your seat and we'll get the next people queued up. Sir. Hi. I have a question for Bill. Yeah. I first saw the body of work you were sharing here at a different institution in New York at the Museum of Sex where it had been installed in a separate room with a bar and everything. Could you talk a little bit about how that show came about and what uh, kind of what the the purpose of that was or? Yeah sure. Yeah. Um, there's uh, I guess about a year ago, I got a call, uh, I live in New York, from uh, the curator at the Museum of Sex um, on Fifth Avenue and 27th Street. And they were looking for something to cover uh, the disco era. And um, they came across my book. And the thing that they liked about my book was the fact that they didn't want to uh, focus on celebrities. They wanted to focus more on the culture of disco. And that's basically what my book does. 
So at first they asked me if they could use one of my pictures just as an ad in the subway, as a subway ad. Um, and there was some discussion of, you know, at some point turning this into an exhibition. So they ran the subway ad and then we had later discussions and we talked about what we would do. And my general idea was that it would be great if you could create a space, which they had actually, um, where you could walk in off the street in 2017 back to 1997 and be in, in the fe have the feeling of a disco in that, in that time. And so that was kind of where the starting point of it all. And so they, they did a terrific job creating the lighting and, and you know, they basically reworked the entire room. There is a bar there and they do serve drinks from that era, like Long Island iced tea, <laughs> you know, and um, at, at like 1970s prices too, which is always oh, wow. good. <laughs> And, and, and the exhibit is for free, too. So it's, you know, I always tell people it's a good excuse to go to the Museum of Sex. You know? <laughs> Most people don't really want to go, but, you, you know, and you, it's free. And um, they picked out a selection of my images that um, really describe about six or seven different clubs. Um, and they also added some pictures that aren't in the book because of the sexual nature of them, because I really wanted to describe that part of it because it's the Museum of Sex. And the literature really describes each one of the clubs and how it started and who started it and who, who went there. Um, and, you know, it's just become very popular. It was supposed to go, uh, it was supposed to be up until February and then they decided to extend it to the end of the year. So. If anyone's in New York, it's really a fun thing to do. Yeah. Great. Sir? Uh, hello, thank you for being here. Um, my question, uh, obviously disco is important, and that's why we're here. Um, I feel like one of the main themes uh, that's coming uh, out of this uh, is that disco uh, create this inclusion and empowerment vibe. And that's what made it important, or at least what's one of the core of it. But then that also lends itself easily to commodification, right? Um, I, this is more of an open-ended question, but uh, commodification is, I think, one of the things behind backlash uh, against disco. Uh, and I wondered uh, the panelists' thoughts on uh, this paradox between inclusion empowerment and yet easy commodification. So I, I think you were asking about commodification, and I think you were suggesting that commodification was one of the reasons that disco became sort of the whipping boy, right? Um, I think it's really interesting because I, I think it is true, as I was saying, that um, certainly people who were in the gay movement, uh, political movement, assumed that, you know, it would be, community centers, gay community centers, um, and gay community dances held in those centers, um, and the activities out of those centers um, that would really become the glue for, um, for gay men and for their communities. And as I said, in fact, it turned out to be the bathhouses and the discos. And Dennis Altman, the, one of the gay activists whose work I, I cited in my talk, said that he found it both ironic and disappointing that as gay men, and I think he meant also lesbians, um, became freer, as he put it in their sexuality, they also became, and again, to quote him, more reliant, more reliant on business institutions. And I think that that's true. On the other hand, um, you have another gay writer, this person from Britain, Richard Dyer, a cultural studies scholar, who as early as 1979 was making the argument that in some circumstances, capitalist cultural production, which at a certain point in time disco became, can produce really unlikely and even transgressive results. So, you know, scholars debate um, commodification and they've been doing it for decades. Um, they've been doing it about the 1920s, you know, um, because it, it turns out that a lot of more recent scholarship would suggest that 
you know, there was a lot wrong in the 1920s, including the um, income inequality, um, which we know a little about today, um, because we've exceeded it. But it's certainly true that for people of color and for women, um, again, people who in some respects were on the margins culturally, that commodification, uh, whether it was happening in the movies or in um, the spread of movies or in the spread of department stores, could have, and I know this, again, may seem counterintuitive, but it could be used in ways that were, were understood to be liberatory to those groups. So a lot of scholarship really debating this. It's a very good question. Yeah. Um, also, I, I think I just want to make two um, sort of entry, uh, additional points about that. The one is I, I'm not sure that um, all forms of commodification sort of are, in some sense, at war with some social project. Yeah. Um, in fact, when it comes to, I think, I mean, I'm speculating a little bit, but um, the sort of um, uh, gay liberation, more or less, I think it's deeply mired in social sort of um, uh, and cultural um, icons and symbols that are mobilized on television and then later online and so on, you know, modern family and so on. And that, that played a role. It wasn't just on the picket fence. It wasn't just act up, you know, picketing El Gore. It was also, in some sense, happening in a so-called commodified space. So I don't think these things are antithetical. That said, I think in the history of music, the role of automated technologies um, has put, you know, increasing numbers of people out of work. Mm. So we have the story of automation, you know, Tesla barely hires an employer and so on. It's now all, actually music is in some sense the vanguard of this. Um, and so yeah. it, back to the TR-808, which in the context of, uh, you know, house music became initially just a way of amping up the party mm. um, or, the, or, or the turntable, the Panasonic, right? It's such an important techno, technological device for early hip hop and became spaces that are a little bit like yours, are sonic geographies where people galvanized in ways that were deeply, deeply indifferent to the commodity form and yet tethered to the technologies that were going to, in the future, put people out of work. I think it's a, it's a tricky question and not something we want to be you know, easy and dualistic about. I, you know, I would, I would also add that you know, one, of the, one of the reasons that, that so many rock and rollers um, resented disco, of course, is that very many of their clubs and bars uh, were turned into discos and mm. they had no work. Mm. Um, and that was a real complaint and an understandable grievance. Yeah. Miss? Hi. I'm up here in the back. Oh. Way up in the back because I can't get down to the uh, microphone down there. Um, my question is for Alice, and I wanted to ask about uh, the phenomena of Grace Jones and the gay community uh, during the disco era, and if you have any comments about that, um, particularly in reference to the Paradise Garage, which was uh, a big meeting place uh, during the disco era, that Grace Jones was practically royalty. Thank you. Yeah, I mean... Grace Jones, obviously a very, very important figure. Um, she turned up at Studio 54, too. Yeah. But, um, but the garage was uh, certainly one of the most important discos in, in New York City. And it was important because it resisted quite deliberately that sort of homogenization um, and exclu you know, and the kind of exclusionism that existed in some discos, yeah. um, and you know, again, the people who, and Mel Charon was one of those people. Was somebody I cited in my talk. Um, were quite deliberate in trying to make a space that that really, truly was inclusive. And I think Grace Jones was a really important figure because whatever her own sexual desires, wherever they went, I don't know anything about, but she was certainly somebody who, in the way that she presented, presented as queer. And so she was, she could be understood, she should be understood, I think, as an ally. So I think she was a very important figure. Um, again, as I think um, the women of LaBelle were, 
as well. I just wanted to make a comment and to add on to some of the stuff that you guys have been talking about. And one of them is that the disco era, that music has been recycled over and over and over again. And then one of the other things is that the musicians from that time, they are still out there and touring. And that's one of the things I think we, don't, we need to make sure we don't forget. The Gloria Gaynors, you know, the Bee Gees were doing something before, you know, the Bee Gees, uh, some of the brothers started dying and some of the other musicians from that time are still touring, which is very important so that that music still is alive and then uh, even piggybacking on that is like you were saying the DJs and some of the um, young rappers and some of the musicians of today are sampling tremendously yeah. from that era so I to comment on what you were saying is where is that music going to be I don't think it's ever going to die yeah I because agree. it's always going to be recycled you, someone is always going to be doing a 70s theme party. That still goes on in tremendous amounts, you know. So it's always an easy go-to for one thing if you yeah. wanted to do a theme party. So I think it's always going to be around. It's just going to maybe for, um, change in some instances, but it's always going to be the core um, 70s music, that core disco is always going to be there in whatever iteration it's going to be in the future. Yeah. Absolutely Thank true, you. and in terms of rap, I mean, really, the, the, so much of the rhythmic architecture of early rap was um, derived from Sheik's Good Times, which, of course, was the sample used in the first big crossover um, rap record by Grandmaster Flash, so, or by the Sugar Hill Gang, I stand corrected. Um, so. It's, um, it's absolutely true. It's sort of inescapable. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, having lived through all of that music, and all of it uh, is really about the beat that distinguishes it, and this is what, why it's great for me to come to this, because to me, when I was living through it, it was all merging into one. I was going to, you know, one time hearing Earth, Wind, and Fire. The next day, I'd go Parla Funkadelic. And so the distinction between the disco, I, until I came here and got a, you know, I knew who I liked. I'd see uh, Nona Hendrix and, and all of them, and, but I didn't see that clear distinction it all sort of merged and that's why I kind of agree I agree with her too that I don't think it'll ever go away I just think it kind of evolves as you said but what you mentioned a little bit but what is this is it the base but I hear the base and everything <laughs> but that's me so what would you say is specifically the beat in disco that distinguishes it from well, Funkadelics or anybody else well, that's a great question. I mean, what, what really right. is disco? Um, I think that the 4-4 thump was pretty important. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was derived from Motown. Right. And, and see, you know, I mean, you I know. Don't, I don't hear, I, I hear, I see the different singers, but I'm not, I'm trying to. But I think that, that there are some distinctions. And, and again, these really derive from the music that was coming out of Philadelphia. Philadelphia International Records, PIR, Gamble and Huff. Right. And they were creating soul music that was lusher, it was silkier, there were different instruments being used, um, more, you know, instead of a trombone, they would use like the fuglehorn or something. <laughs> they would use different, different sounds and they were going for a more deliberately sophisticated sound. And so that was why I was saying that in some sense, you can understand what they were doing as an act of rebellion against the notion that soul music had to sound a particular way. One of my favorite quotes is from Mary Wilson of the Supremes from her, me from her memoir, in which she said, you know, I was constantly, and the Supremes were always being criticized for not being soulful enough, but why, why is it that I have to sound like Aretha Franklin? No knock against Aretha, love her, but come on. Why can't there be diversity, right? Um, but I think that, that disco did sort of amplify um, Motown music in the sense that Motown 2 was, was deliberately working to try to 
get out of uh, what had once been called the Chitlin Circuit right. and to really sell to white Americans, but not in a way that, in my view, not in a way that compromised that music. That music was soulful. Um, Motown music was soulful and disco music was soulful. Right. Um, but I think it is very, very difficult, I mean, to try to actually, what was disco? What is disco? And one of the things that, that I argue in Hot Stuff is that it's curious to me the extent to which we try to create uh, these very narrow sort of categories for disco and what constitutes disco, when that's not true for rock music. Right. You know, you say punk rock is considered rock music, right? Um, you could say blues rock is country rock, but it's considered rock. I mean, nobody is trying to coordinate it off and put it in its own little box. Whereas with disco, it's assumed that, for instance, um, that David Bowie's fame wasn't disco, but at the time it was heard and discussed as disco. What about PIL's Vaterstomp, which played at Studio 54? That was John Lydon's second group after the Sex Pistols. In my mind, that was disco. Blondie was, a lot of Blondie was disco. Madonna was disco. Um, Lords, as I said, green light sounds a disco to me. So I take the expansive view. Yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> To the question of the beat um, and Alice's question, I mean, I mean, the answer was basically covering it, but um, there's one thing maybe I would want to just pull out and draw some attention to about how the beat is organized. Um, and I think this prominence, again, of the open hi-hat in between mm -hmm. the dominant beat, yeah. so that when you're tuned into a song that doesn't have that many chord changes, it starts to take on a certain kind of hypnotic character that that it almost, you can't quite tell if it's speeding up or slowing down against the main beat. It has sort of accelerating, decelerating effects within that environment. And that becomes, I think, a dominant feature of how a beat, how the beat, if that's just technically about how the beat gets organized. And then that gets pulled out in a very sort of prominent way, almost a muscular insistence on an alternative. One might even want to make some sort of more speculative case about how that relates to subcultures and so on. I mean, if we think of Chaka Khan, like, um, uh, 1974, you know, tell me something good. That's an absolute on off. That is like taking funk to a new level. Mm. And through this insistent, uh, insistence on the off beat, the in between beat, um, uh, so, so that we have these moments that give us definitive, how should we say, syntax for disco. Maybe. Written though by Stevie Wonder, wasn't it? I'm not sure. I think so. And, and the thing that's interesting about Chaka Khan's group then, Rufus, was that. They did not define themselves according to genre. They prided themselves on being genre-less. I mean, they developed some strange name for what they did, but they saw themselves as being right at the intersection of funk and rock. It's Fascinating. Yeah. As did LaBelle. Time for one last question. Oh, um, I, I wanted also to make a comment. When doo-wop became rock and roll, it was the advent of the guitar, the guitar footprint. And that you would could clearly say, when Bob Dylan went electric, that was a huge movement. Did anything in disco reach that? Bo Diddley had his own beat. And I don't think it was the artists who were trying to define themselves, it was the radio stations radio stations decided what they were going to play and if the uh, and as disco was in its heyday the eagles were still being played on other radio stations selling trillions of records so it it's the marketplace and it's where you get broadcast in the marketplace someone dj might say i um don't want to play PIL. Now, things have changed now. We're in a modern world where people can download and stream and do whatever they wanted to do. But until that happened, people were prisoners of a certain radio station and what was there, what they were playing. Okay, I'm going to take issue with you a bit. <laughs> <laughs> then you can handle it, don't worry. Because, yeah. because here's the thing. You know, 
people were always saying about disco. It was something that was basically cooked up in the back room by all these major label guys, right? No, I worked at Atlantic okay. Records. Okay. I was director of publicity of, of all of that. And um, it was money. People were in it for the money. What's hot? What's new? But people are always, I mean, the idea that music exists outside of the commercial is a delusion, I think. But let's talk about the very early days of the music that became disco. You know, the first big disco hit was Barry White's Love Unlimited Orchestra, Love's Theme, 1973. Radio did not break that song. In fact, his label was completely uninterested in promoting that song. What happened was two very enterprising DJs were visiting somebody at um, Barry White's label, and there was a dead album box, right? They had, they had these bins of dead albums, albums they weren't going to promote, that were going nowhere. And these DJs spied Barry White's album there. And, broke and they it. played it in the clubs, and it was the first time that a single had been broken in the clubs, and then it went to I'd radio. be very careful saying first time, and because you claim that something is a first a disco record. They have been arguing for 50 years, what is the first rock and roll record? No, no, no. I'm not saying it was the first disco record. I'm saying it's the first disco record to a huge hit. And, and, and the point here I'd is have to that see the documentation, but I wanted to take... I so here's, you to, can buy her book. Right. I want to take another point with you, which is... Sandy, I'm so sorry, Sandy, we don't have time because we, uh, we have to go to Gloria now. Okay. I'm sorry, okay. we're, we're done. Um, so as you can tell, disco is an important topic that deserves scholarly attention. <laughs> funny. Um, so this is a, a whole body of work just craving to be unearthed, I think. And um, these are some of the pioneers in doing that, that work. But uh, seriously, if you're out here and you're a grad student or an undergrad even, and uh, you want to do a cool paper, come to the Library of Congress and research primary sources having to do with disco. Who were the people writing the songs and sending them in for copyright? Who was making money off of them versus the people who actually did the creative work? Mm. Who is ripping off Bill's photos? <laughs> or uh, how is Bill working to protect his photos? Um, there's so much cool stuff in this, this area of study. And it kind of, for me, as a musicology type as well, uh, is indicative of the way that popular musical genres are becoming more of the hot thing in scholarship. Uh, you know, there, there's only so much that we can do with, well, no, I'm not going to say that because I'll get in trouble. <laughs> you can study Bach for eternity, right? However, there's a lot of other musical genres that, that need that kind of attention, that kind of discourse, so that we find out what was really going on. Because like with disco, okay, I grew up with disco, I heard it, you know, from my parents, uh, listening to their records, and then I got the pure disco CD for my BMG music subscription, because I'm, I'm that old or young enough, however you want to put it. And I have one and two, uh, and then, uh, you know, you get a certain perception of it from what you grow up with and what's in the media, just like we're talking about the commodity business. Um, but that's not necessarily all of what was going on, and Bill's book sheds light on that in a very visual way, which is fantastic. And then if you want to go back and see... Um, for example, the film 54, you can compare uh, that to what the actual primary, primary source document reveals. Uh, so there's a lot of fun stuff to do. And even if you're not a researcher, just come and hang out and explore, because that's honestly what we're here for. Okay? We're here for all people, regardless of your interests, professional, academic, if you're a high school student. Uh, if you're at home uh, trolling Twitter, you will find cool primary sources having to do with disco from the Library of Congress. Who knew? Um, so, a bit of logistics before we switch over to the next thing, and I, we do have a giant surprise for you, so you need to stay in your seats. Nobody run away. Thank you, Martin, Alice, and Bill. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Welcome everyone to Library of Congress Biblio Discotheque. My name is Nicholas Brown and I am a music specialist at the Library of Congress's music division. The Library of Congress is the largest library in the world and within that we have the largest music library in the world so we are super excited to be bringing disco to you uh, all day today and out online to our viewers on Facebook and YouTube. Can we give it up for those viewers who are all over the world please? Library of Congress Biblio Discotheque is a month-long look at disco music, dance, fashion, and culture, where it came from and how it has influenced popular culture since the 1970s. These programs have been made possible through partnerships with a host of cultural institutions and organizations, both based here in DC and that are nationally recognized, including the Recording Academy, Brightest Young Things, Capital Pride, the District of Columbia Library Association, and the Silent Dance Society. This program specifically is made possible at the Library of Congress by the generosity and support of private donations. If you would like to see more programs like this happen in the future, we invite you to visit loc.gov disco, yes, we made that themed just for today, <laughs> uh, to make a contribution of an amount of your choosing. Throughout the special events coming up for the rest of the day, we invite you to live tweet using the hashtag LCDisco. You're also invited to tag at Library Congress and at L-I-B-N of Congress, which is Dr. Hayden's uh, Twitter account. Now, if you thought Biblio Discotheque was awesome, uh, we have some other really amazing things coming up for you in the next few weeks. We have a new pop-up exhibit series beginning in June with an exhibit called Pride in the Library featuring LGBTQ collection items and also references to LGBTQ communities in the US and abroad. And then the following week, also in June, we are opening up Library of Awesome, which is actually the title and it's pretty awesome. And uh, it is uh, happening at the same time as AwesomeCon and the library is gonna be bringing out its unparalleled comic book collections. This is first editions of things like Superman, uh, the, all the Marvel, that kind of stuff. It's going to be mind-blowing, so please mark your calendars. You can visit our website at loc.gov to find out all of the details. Also this summer, we're going to host the first ever outdoor summer film series at the Library of Congress, which will start in July. For more on that, visit loc.gov. Now without further ado, I'm going to bring out a very special treat for you. Um, here at the Library of Congress, we are very fortunate one, to have an amazing cast of uh, librarians and uh, subject experts and technicians and uh, architect of the Capitol staff and U.S. Capitol Police. Uh, and something that brings us all together is amazing leadership. And here at the Library of Congress, we have some of the hippest librarians uh, that are found anywhere in the world. And the, the two hippest ones uh, for you are going to be Dr. Carla Hayden, who is, of course, the 14th Librarian of Congress and the Deputy Librarian of Congress, Robert Newland. Please give it up for Dr. Hayden and Robert Newland. Okay, here's the pitiful part. We've been practicing that for weeks. <laughs> we really have. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Disco Week at the Library of Congress. Thank you, Nicholas Brown, for all your hard work. Yeah, Nick, you deserve some applause. Solomon Holly Selassie, Angela Newburn, and Clay Pensick, thank you for all the work that you've done to make this possible. So, Dr. Hayden, we're both products of the 70s. We started out as librarians in the 70s and still here and alive and well. We went to library school. Um, in the 70s, and we made it through. We did. And Robert started an illustrious career at the Library of Congress, 
And I went to teach and public libraries, and here we are, 40-something years later, together as partners. So we're thankful. Now, we also um, were talking about 70s fashion, and you'll notice what we're wearing. <laughs> this is as far as we can go now. Yes. <laughs> But and wait until tonight. Has she got an outfit? And let's just say there's going to be more hair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I couldn't grow it back then. By the time I grew it, the 70s were over. Yes. Uh, but what we're saying is that the fashion in the 70s, when we looked back at some of the photos, and we said, oh my God, yeah, right. it's an oxymoron, fashion in the 70s. Yes. <laughs> However, you could ex excuse the fashion because of the music. It's true. And tell me, what was your favorite disco song of the era? The one that still stays with me, and that's why they were playing it when we came out, was We Are Family. It symbolizes so much in terms of there are all kinds of families, and it brings everybody together. And so I was really pleased to select it this year to be put into the National Registry. Now. now, you should know before I got here, Robert was part of the selection process and he got to select your favorite disco song. Three guesses. I will survive. <laughs> So one of the exciting things is that we can place wonderful songs that have a great legacy like this on the, um, the National Recording Registry. And it's something that you can contribute to as well. All you have to do is go to our website, loc.gov, and search Recording Registry, and you can make suggestions too for what you would like to see on, on that registry. So. Think about it because it's not just songs that maybe were the top 20. They're songs that resonate with you. And we want to also use the registry to introduce people to music and significant works of art and just culture. So think of any song or any recording that you would like us to consider. And we'd love to have it. And think about today as being a window into the entire music collection of the Library of Congress. It's an amazing, amazing um, collection, and so much of, his, of it is accessible through our website. So I hope you'll take the opportunity to explore it. So speaking of I Will Survive, the reason why we are really here today is because of the music and the persona, really, of the legendary Gloria Gaynor. You want to talk about our song? I feel like we're at the Academy Awards. I do, I do. Well, as we said, her hit song, I Will Survive, was inducted into the Library of Congress National Recording Registry in 2016. Uh, hey, just like us, her legendary <laughs> career spans 40 years. <laughs> and she looks better. Yes, well, I have to say that too, and has never lost steam. We just had the privilege of being uh, backstage with Ms. Gaynor and we were showing her some treasures from our collection. We were showing her the original manuscript from Porgy and Bess and she impromptu started singing Summertime. And it was quite a moment. And she then looked at uh, the score and this is in George uh, Gershwin's hand. These are with his notes and everything to what she said, one of my favorite songs, my, Our Love is Here to Stay. Yeah, and then she gorgeous. started to hum that. Well, I must tell you, Robert had a moment. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I, I was verklempt, I admit it. <laughs> it was really wonderful. And one of the things that she'll be talking about today is her second book, We Will Survive, True Stories of Encouragement, Inspiration, and the Power of Song. And Joining 
her on stage to discuss her book and her career is a person you invite into your home every morning. I know my mother does, and there are very few things that you can do to uh, sometimes either impress your parents or to show them their efforts were worth it. I was able to let her stand by and meet the co-anchor of ABC's Good Morning America, the Emmy Award-winning journalist and an author herself, Ms. Robin Roberts. So, without further ado, please welcome to the Library of Congress's Bibliodiscotheque, Robin Roberts, and the one, the only, Gloria, Gloria Gaynor. Gaynor. Love you, Gloria. They love you. Oh, thank you. I had to dig this they jacket out of the too. back of my closet, but you know, <laughs> I'm a child of the '70s, honey. I'm a child, proud of I'm it. I'm loving proud it. Proud of it. Proud I'm of it. it. Gloria Gaynor. I'm telling you, you have just inspired me and and countless others, and I've been looking forward to just sitting and chatting with you and letting people get to know even more about you. Now, music was a part. Of your home from the beginning. You grew Absolutely. up with music. Tell us about that. I grew up that. with music. My mother sang, um, not professionally, but she had a wonderful voice. Uh, and of course, in my estimation, the most beautiful voice in the world. Aww. And my father sang as well, but my father did sing professionally for a time. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was the opening act for uh, 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 an act back then called Step and Fetch It. What was that again? Step and Fetch It. And, um, and he played um, ukulele mm -hmm. and sang. And your brothers, weren't they in a, a gospel? My brothers all sang. They were not in a gospel group. They had, they formed a group of their own. Right. It was just in the neighborhood. They didn't do anything professionally. But they would sing on, in, on the street corners and in front of the house and wherever they could. Um, when I was growing up in the neighborhood where I grew up, these little bands would collect on the street corners during the summer, and they would just start playing conga drums and bongo drums and singing and dancing. And, and as I grew up and became a teenager going to high school, traveling a bit from my home to go to school, mm -hmm. I was very saddened that the whole world wasn't like that. I thought that it, happened everywhere. Isn't that amazing when you yeah. grow up? What you see, you feel that that's, that's universal. The world. That's right, your world, right. so you yeah. feel that that's the world. Right, exactly. Yeah. When did you realize that, that disco was going to be its own genre? I realized that while I was still singing rhythm and blues and jazz. I was performing uh, all, all up and down the East Coast and a, a lot in New York City and in, in cabarets. Mm -hmm. And they suddenly, the disco music, this dance music started coming out, and um, Barry White really was probably the first one to. Barry uh, White. He's called the Barry, Barry White. White, yes. Barry, Barry White, White. yeah. <laughs> he, yes. he was called the king of disco. Ooh. And so the, they were in, in the clubs that I was in, the um, uh, cabaret clubs that I was working in, they started to move chairs. And, and make dance floors. And they would have, there would invariably be a closet that they would take the door, open the door, cut the top half of it off, put a plank like this um, across the bottom half of it, and that was where the DJ's turntable sat. And there was your discotheque. <laughs> Just yeah. like that. Just like that. And so then someone got the bright idea of starting to build discotheques mm. from the ground up to build establishments that were specifically for people who wanted to come in and dance. Yes. And um, yeah. So and, and hear music. That's when I realized, okay, this, this. is going to happen. <laughs> and this is a market that doesn't have any music at the moment, has very little music that is specific to this style of of partying, and so I think I'm going to supply them. Yes, you did. Yeah. Yes, you did. You most certainly did, and we're glad that you did. Fill a need. Yeah, <laughs> fill a need. 
<laughs> Perry Pace. Yeah. How did you go about, I will survive, creating that, writing that? When did you become a part of the creative process? I, I didn't write it at all. I, I um, had, I don't know if you know the story, I'd been in, mm -hmm. in, in um, performing in New York and fell backwards over a monitor during a performance jumped back up, finished my show, went out to breakfast, and went home, went to bed, woke up the next morning paralyzed from the waist down. Mm. Yeah. And, um, but I was only paralyzed for, the t for the, that period of time and until a, a while after I got to the hospital. Whatever they did to work on me, they relieved the nerves and the paralysis was gone. I don't remember any of it. The first thing I remember is saying, did they serve lunch yet? <laughs> <laughs> But I was in the yeah, yeah, yeah. from March until July because they were wow. trying everything they could, uh, traction and had to have a spinal tap. Scary. Um, there was no such thing as an MRI then, mm. so they were really trying to find out exactly what was going wrong and what they could do. So they ended up giving me surgery on my spine, uh, having a, a fusion, spinal fusion, bone graft from my hips. and and all of that, and so when I came, while I was in the hospital, I was like, okay, so what do you mean by this? What are we gonna do? Because the record company had told me they were not going to renew my contract. People were going around the record company saying the queen is dead. And so I was really, really praying. I hadn't prayed for a long time. You know how we do sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I was like, you know, praying. I, got a Bible and started reading and all of this. And I left the hospital quite confident that God was going to do something. I didn't know what. While I was at home, not long after, a few weeks after I was home, the record company sent me a letter saying they were not going to end my contract. And they wanted me to go out to California to record a song that the record company president has chosen. When I got out there, um, uh, I talked to the producers and wanted to know what was the B-side. Remember the B-side? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, you remember that. How many of you all remember Some the B-side? Yes, yes. Yeah. If you didn't clap, ask the person next to you. <laughs> uh, so the B-side um, was called Substitute. So I asked them, what is going to be the A-side? I mean, the A-side was Substitute. So I asked them, what's going to be the B-side? And they said, well, um, what kind of songs do you like? And I said, well, I like songs that are meaningful, that uh, touch people's hearts, that have good melodies, um, people can sing along, you know. So they said, you know what? We think you're the one we've been waiting for to record this song we wrote two years ago. So they held I Will Survive for two years, waiting for the right person. And you were the right before. person. <laughs> yeah. And I just looked up and said, thank you. Yeah. Because when I read the lyrics, I realized that this was a timeless lyric. And I said to them, I said, this is a timeless lyric. What are you, stupid? You're going to put this on the B side? And they said, well, maybe if it gets a chance. I said, well, if it's got anything to do with me, it will get a chance now. Because as I said, it's a timeless lyric. Everyone is going to be and able to relate it. to it. And you knew it. You knew it. I knew it when it right I read there. the lyrics. Because I'm standing there relating to this song, back being brace, in a back brace. Yeah. The fact that my mother had passed it. I mean, it had been like nine years since my mother passed away, mm -hmm. but that was something I never thought I'd survive. Yeah, I know that. And uh, I was still suffering from that. If, uh, those of you who have lost your parents, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know how many years ago, you're still suffering. And um, so, yeah, I thought anybody was going to be, relate, everybody's going to be able to relate to this. And so, you know, time has proved me right. So when you stepped on the stage and you sang that, mm -hmm. what was the response from the audience? And when it was played on the radio, what was, how did it resonate with people? Well, first, let me tell you that when, we when I got the, the, the song in my hands and took it to the record company to say, this should be the A side, you need to promote this, they wouldn't even listen to it. Mm -mm. So we, because the president had chosen another song, nobody wanted to go against his choices. So we went to Studio 54. Oh yeah. Gave it to the DJ there, he played it, and the audience immediately loved it. I said, okay, I know I am right, because the New York audiences are so jaded. They don't immediately <laughs> love anything. And if they, yeah, I am, yeah, I'm, this is right. So we gave him a stack of them. He gave right. them to his friends around New York, and they began to play it. People began to request it on radio, um, and, uh, because they want to hear it on the way home. They want to hear it on the way to work. And... The rest is history. Yeah. Well, what was your experience 
1970s, this music is bringing people from diverse communities together, yes, that yes. they have a voice. What was yes. that experience yes. like? It was, it, was, it was a discovery for me. I discovered that there was one music, the only music in the history of music, ever to bring together people from onto the dance floor, people from every nationality, race, creed, color, and age group. And that was amazing to me, and I was in the forefront of that. And so I, I felt really privileged. I felt really great about it, especially since it is a music that is so uplifting, so encouraging. So you didn't bring people together to moan together. <laughs> right, you know right, what I'm right, right, right. You didn't bring people together to cry, you know, to complain. You brought people together to uplift and encourage and inspire one another. And this is why I've done a website called IWillSurvive.org. Please go to it because it is a community for that very purpose, where people come together and tell one and tell their stories, uplift and encourage one another. It's a charity-based website on which you can purchase. We love to purchase, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and at the same time, support a charity of your choice. And some of the charities are represented, maybe, I don't know if here, but they're going to be here. Yeah, Aww. yeah, they are. There's, there's, there's um, uh, uh, BCRF, there's Thrive, mm. there is um, uh, um, Dan and Ron's um, Animal Rescue, there's um, TAPS mm -hmm. for, the, for the soldiers. For, for the veterans. For the, vet, right. for mm -hmm. the veterans and a number of, go on, please go on and see all of these charities that you can support while you're encouraging, uplifting one another. Join this community because it's, it's, it's really great. Because when you say I will survive, everybody can take it personally and, and use it differently. It, it means Absolutely. something different for, for everyone, doesn't yes, it? Yes, yes. Yeah. It does mean something. It, you, it can be applied to so yeah, many different right. areas of your life, so many different things, all of which, any of which might be things that you are feeling is insurmountable and yet hoping mm -hmm. you'll survive. Mm -hmm. and, and that way we can relate to one another because of those things. Yeah, I can relate when you were talking about my, my mom and daddy, they are cheering us on right now from mm. their heavenly balcony. Mm. And I thought like you, I'm like, I am not, how am I gonna survive without yeah. Lawrence, Colonel Lawrence and Lucy Marion Roberts and then yeah. going through health crisis and, mm, and that. And course. so I, I understand and so many people, who are, the, yeah. who are fellow thrivers here who've been through something and, and it's gotten, that's been your, it's been your anthem. And, and to know that it's here in the library, oh, so I gotta sit up, Library of Congress. And we, we heard earlier, oh. you know, you know, come on now. Come on, what that means. My friends would tell you it is not normal for me to be speechless. <laughs> but it, it, it does, it, 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 it's overwhelming to know that someone who started from such humble beginnings, that I can, mm. I can say that, you know, I'm, I'm now going to be history. You know, people will come for, for years to come and be inspired by something that I've done. Uh, something that I've been a part of, and it's, it's such an honor. It's such an unbelievable honor to be here, to be sitting before you, to be a part of, of the, the Library of Congress, to be inducted into the Library of Congress, to be a part of American history. It is wonderful, and it's not only wonderful because for me, but I'm hoping that it's wonderful for so many other people who started like me, right. who are starting out even now like me, to know what heights you can reach simply by the gifts, talents, and abilities that God has placed in you. Amen. And we all have them. We all have them. Yes. I love that. You, you know, Gloria, as you became emotional when you were looking at the pieces of Mozart mm -hmm. and other pieces that they shared with you mm -hmm. today, yes. they're going to, years from now, there's going to be somebody like yourself coming mm -hmm. in and they're going to see your music mm -hmm. and see I Will Survive and that. And just talk about how you became emotional 
when seeing the great recordings that are here and the great archives that are here? I, 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 I looked at that music and realized that I was being, having the privilege of being transported back in time. You know, we don't really need a time machine. <laughs> to be transported back in time to, 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 to experience and gain the, the rich, be benefit by the rich legacy that other artists and other people have left from, from their arts, from their talents, from their abilities. This, that's what this place is all about and what an honor to, to stand there and see that and, and be a part of it and to experience it and to know that it is still available to me now, that someone had the forethought to preserve these wonderful right. things, that I can benefit from them, I can see them, that I can experience them, that it's... Can you express the importance of it for not only you, the general public that can come here mm -hmm. and witness this and, and, and see it, and to also know that disco, Mm. The culture, the fashion, all of it, <laughs> you know, is part of this. And you brought this here. It's, it's important to, for, for, for self-discovery. It's important to, to, to recognize, as I said earlier, that you can do this. Anybody can do this. Just hone in on what you have or who you are and be recognized, as I've, I've, I've often said recently, you are a designer's original. Mm. Yeah. Every single one of us is a designer's original. Every single one of us has been given something to contribute to the betterment, to the welfare, to the, to the progress, to the pleasure of mankind. And, and if we hone in on what that is, not try to be someone else, not to try to have what admire other people, but recognize that you have something too to contribute. And recognize what that is and be about finding out what your purpose is and bringing that purpose to the pot, so to speak. It's a wonderful thing because that's what we're all meant to do. And deep down inside somewhere, that's what each and every one of us wants to do. Yeah. And we have great guardians here, the people, the staff, yes. the Library of Congress, yes. don't we? we? We do. They are a special people. This is what they bring. Mm -hmm. This is their particular talent, their particular ability to preserve what we've done. Everything that is being preserved here is showing off their talent, their abilities, their uh, um, desire to be a part of humankind, to add to, to contribute to humankind. Yeah, their passion is, and, and their passion and compassion is, is unparalleled. Is and now I Will Survive is going to be among them. I know that you performed mm -hmm. for the 30th anniversary Michael Jackson concert. <laughs> uh, thriller is also here, you know. Yes, okay, yes. so yeah, Thriller is also here. Yes, it's wonderful. Um, the album, great. Uh, I, know, I know a little bit, of, little bit about that. that this, bring, this is bringing me back. This uh -huh. is bringing me back I to my agree. great college yeah. days. What was it like to perform for Michael Jackson, and not many people got to know him. It was wonderful to perform for someone that I called and believed to be the consummate survivor. Mm. He survived so many different things throughout his life, and to stand there on stage and perform for him was, and to have him sitting in the audience applauding and smiling and all of that was absolutely wonderful. I became 295 and a half half percent grade A ham. Because <laughs> I had to do my best for the best. Uh -huh. And it was wonderful. Give us some backstories of, of some other songs. I never can say goodbye. I am what I am. I am what I am uh, was brought to me by my producer. He had been to the play La Caja Fole and heard the song right sitting in his seat watching the play he decided he it would make a great disco song mm -hmm. came up with the arrangement called me the next day and had me come over to the, his studio and listen to what 
his idea for the song. I was like, great, this, this is a great idea. Was very, very happy to do that. And I was thinking of, as we, I was going through the lyrics, I was thinking of all the different things that, all the different reasons why people need to say, I am what I am. Mm -hmm. As I said, I'm a designer's original. I am not any more, any less than you or anybody else. And uh, because of who I am and what I am and how I look and what I wear and what I think and how I feel and all, any of that. Mm. <laughs> Makes me anything less than anybody else. And yeah, I am what I am. I am what I am. And it's, it's everyone wants to feel inclusive, that you're, that you're part of something. And that's what I am what I am. And, and other songs that you have brought to us. Mm. Um, do you think that's part of the message about being inclusive? Yes, I really do. Because I think that's why disco music is so popular because it is inclusive. Mm -hmm. It is inclusive. It, like I said, every nationality, race, creed, color, age group, everything, everybody is included in this music. Come together and let's, let's be a family. And if, if you wouldn't mind, if you wouldn't mind, I have something that I think I, I'd like to say. And, Please. And it fits right here. I'm gonna, if you don't mind, walk well, over to the podium and do this. You're Gloria Gaynor, you do what there. you want. <laughs> Me. Bear with me as I do this. Do these work? Are these working? Are these, are these working? Wonderful, wonderful. Okay. Survive is defined as to remain alive, to sustain oneself, pull through, hold on or out, to keep body and mind together. In 1978, I recorded the song, I Will Survive. Since then, untold millions of men, women, and children, as you know, have adopted this song as their mantra, including myself. But through the years, I've come to realize that while we were singing, I will survive with our mouths, what we were hoping in our hearts is that I am going to thrive. Yeah. Thrive is defined as to continue to live in spite of danger, hardship, and to manage to keep going in difficult circumstances. Everyone goes through difficult situations and circumstances in their lives and we need to recognize that and be aware of other people's struggles and be willing to help when and where we can. If we don't care about others, we cannot expect anyone to care about us and none of us will survive. If one group begins to perpetrate inhumane acts against another while everyone else simply stands by and ignores what's happening, it provides impetus for other selfish individuals and groups to do the same until such acts become commonplace and seemingly normal. The atrocities of the death camps of Auschwitz, the slavery of the Confederate States of the United States, South Africa's apartheid, the slavery of the Confederate States of the United States, South Africa, South Africa's apartheid, the ethnic cleansing of the Bosnian War all went on far too long, and those that managed to survive did not do so without the help of concerned and caring others. Any of it can happen again, anywhere, at any time. As the adage goes, the only thing necessary for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. So it is up to each one of us to read about, know the stories, relate, tell and discuss the stories with others to keep them fresh in our minds because if we don't care about all persons and watch out for each other, evil will prevail and no one is exempt. These United States of America used to stand for under the banner of one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Part of that liberty and justice means that if what I believe to be truth is different from what you believe to be truth. We can and do share what we each believe without reproach from one another. It means that we are able to disagree without being disagreeable. It means we share our beliefs with one another without condemnation. It means we speak the truth to one another in love. It means that we respect one another enough to examine what the other believes to be the truth, to find what truth we might be able to accept in what they are saying. It means that if we are sure that what we believe is true, 
we show no hostility, disdain, arrogance, or anger toward anyone else's point of view. We show no hostility. We have no problem with or fear of listening to what someone else has to say because we are confident in our own beliefs. If I had a diamond and someone else had a cubic zirconia, and they felt that that diamond, that cubic zirconia was just as valuable as my diamond, I wouldn't be angry with them. I would try to share with them what I know to be the difference and the benefit of the diamond and what it has, the benefit that it has over the cubic zirconia. If they refused to listen and never believed me, I would simply hope and pray someone else could and would one day be able to explain it to them in a way they could receive it. If that never happened, that person would simply lose out when they get to retirement age, and I would be very sorry for them. But I would have done all that I could to help. This attitude and way of dealing with others is the only way to live in peace and harmony with others of differing ideals and ideologies. Because of the popularity of I Will Survive, my name has become synonymous with the word survive. That has caused me to take a greater interest in survival, what it means and what it takes to survive. Of course, getting on in age, <laughs> I have to admit, <laughs> adds a little to that. Among the many things that extensive travel has done for me is that it has convinced me of something I already suspected, that I live in the greatest country in the world. I have often quipped that I am 295 and a half percent American. We sing God Bless America. Well, because of what I've seen and experienced in my travels, I can tell you God has blessed America. My travels have also made me cognizant of the fact that we are the babies, or at least the teenagers of the world, and yet we are pretty much running things. America has become a teenage rock star. I learned that people of other nations have loved and respected us. They have sought to emulate us. They have copied everything from our politics, desire for personal freedom and tolerance, to our bad habits of cigarette smoking, strange and ever-changing fashion sense, <laughs> and our bad eating habits. I call McDonald's our American ambassador because it's everywhere. I also find that we have the best junk food in the world. Happen to love that. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your point of view, we are the richest country in the world. Why? We have become like international rock stars, unfortunately, in every way. We seem to be so wrapped up in and impressed with our fame and fortune that we have begun to believe our own hype. When some very important things began to go sour, we just seemed to focus on what was still going good and as much as possible smooth over the bad publicity like the teenage rock star. It seemed to me we didn't try to analyze too close to any ills. We just decided to downplay the cause of any problems and treat the symptoms. <clears throat> I'm really not a political person, so I'm not about to really become political. But I'd say it's, the best, uh, it's a safe bet that a lot needs to change. For one thing, we have become a nation that is obsessed with treating symptoms. I've said to my friends, we here in America have got the remedies for whatever ills you. If you have a pain in your body, we can give you something that will get rid of that pain. Now in the process, your arms and legs might fall off with the side effects, but the pain will probably go with it. We have got to become concerned with treating the core and causes of our problems. We've got to get back to absolutes. Without absolutes, we will perish. We know right from wrong, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> We know right from wrong, we know good from evil, we know how to cure the ills of this nation. We've got to change this infection of greed and selfishness that has consumed this nation. It has to start with you. With you, the individual. You must become, I must become, the instrument in the hands of our Savior. Our savior is righteousness. Our savior is unselfishness. Our savior is grace and mercy for those who are less fortunate than we are. Our savior is concerned for them. Our savior is recognizing that we are a family. And just as with your blood families, there are those we don't particularly like. 
But unselfishness and unrighteousness say that if we are to survive as a family, as a nation, we must all have the opportunities to survive. When you deprive or trample down the rights or opportunities for another person to use their gifts, talents, and abilities to prosper, to reach his or her greatest potential or highest level of productivity, you deprive yourself of whatever that person might have been able or willing to contribute to the betterment of mankind. It really amounts to cutting off your own nose to spite your face. The Bible says we have the inherent ability to hide iniquity in our own hearts. We must understand that when we do that, we make our hearts the breeding ground for sin. Now, that's an old-fashioned word, one that we rarely hear because we are ashamed to say it, although most, many of us are not ashamed to do what it means. The Bible also says that you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. What we need to recognize from those passages is that the truth that you walk in will set you free. In other words, you need to do what you know to be right in order for what you know to set you free. It's as if we've all been put in prison by ignorance, arrogance, and selfishness, and greed. And in, in order to get out, we must pay bail. Our bail is truth. It has been paid because we know the truth. We are free. But we insist on staying in jail and not walking in our freedom. Why? Very simply and very sadly, because everyone is doing it. No one seems to have the courage to say, this is wrong. This is counterproductive. This is not in our best interest in the long run. No one is willing to recognize the fact that if we stay on this path, we will perish. We know the truth, so we're not the blind leading the blind. So when did everyone is doing it become the criteria for our behavior? Are we all followers? Are there no leaders among us? Are we all sheep just following some unwary leader to slaughter? The big difference between us and sheep is that we get to choose our leaders. And to avoid anarchy, we must follow those we choose to lead us. But what criteria are we each individual using to choose our leaders? And are our leaders concerned with or using our needs and desires to make their choices, to create laws that are in the best interest of us who chose them or even in their own best interest? Are we also bogged down in what's good for me, what feels good to me, that selfishness and greed have become the creed of both choosers and the chosen? both the voters and the electors, the elected, have we forgotten that we are one nation under God? Or is that no longer really true? Because we stopped saying it in schools and other government-run establishments out loud in public places, have we truly stopped saying it, believing it, or even wanting it in our hearts? Are we truly so wrapped up in ourselves that we are willing to reject the only one who knows and wants what's best for each of us and the only one who is capable of working things out in a way that we all win. I know some of you are probably thinking, I didn't come here for a sermon. <laughs> well, when I decided to speak, I didn't intend to give one. However, I did want to say things that would be meaningful, helpful, and would call us all to responsibility. This is an idea whose time has come again. The next crop of leaders of this nation, whether in government, and in industry, in corporate America, or in homes, is going to have the responsibility of joining the incumbent leaders in helping this nation fall or rise, fail or prosper, die or survive. We can either survive intentionally together or we can perish by default because not enough of us care enough about anyone else to strengthen the foundation of this nation together. Everyone knows you must care, take care of, and keep strong the foundation. The working class is the foundation. Those who have risen up and become wealthy have done so because we have a strong working class. We stand on their shoulders. Has no one noticed that from the creation of this nation, we have prospered, progressed, and become stronger as a nation as we acknowledge and championed what's right for those too weak to fight for themselves? 
as no one noticed that the nation prospered and became stronger as the working class became stronger and more prosperous, as the downtrodden and victims of discrimination became fewer, and as basic righteous ethics remained our credo. This is no coincidence. Have we all been lulled into a false sense of security only to be awakened by threats from the outside? Well, to quote a famous cartoonist, we've seen the enemy and he's us. Another wise man is quoted as answering the question, what's wrong with the world? I am. If you will study the lessons of such books as Seven Habits of Highly Successful People and The Road to Character, you will learn the characteristics and ethics necessary for sustainable success. You will learn that it is dangerous and you are doomed to eventual failure if you allow your gifts, talents, and abilities to take you to a place where your character cannot sustain you. This applies to a nation as well as an individual. It is equally dangerous because it is, because it is arrogant and a flaw in one's character to think that you can sustain success built on good character even though you allow that good character to deteriorate. That is what this nation has done. The truth is, if you cannot honestly say that you have done all you can to fix what's wrong, you cannot honestly say it's not my fault. I'm not naive enough or idealistic enough to think that this can happen quickly or even within the next generation or two. We need radical change and radical change always calls for revolution. It will be an arduous task. Because while it can be a peaceful, while it must be a peaceful revelation starting in each individual heart, it must be spread throughout the nation, not necessarily to all, but to a large enough majority to bring that radical change. Therefore, it will be met with opposition from those who are so limited in foresight that they prefer the status quo. But every journey begins with one step and this is a journey that must begin. The nation is broken. And as, a great, and as great a task as it is, as unfair as it is, as young people say, it is what it is. And it is our daunting task to fix it. The good news is, we can. Call me an optimist, but I believe we can. But only if enough of us are willing to take the bull by the horns tighten our own belts, refuse to be self-indulgent, refuse to walk in ignorance or arrogance, and recognize that, like it or not, we are a family, and you are your brother's keeper. If we are true to and persistent about these things, I promise you, as a people, as a nation, we will survive. Thank you so much. Thank you for bearing with me through that. And it was on my heart. I'm telling you, we're <laughs> backstage, and Gloria said to me, she said, I, I have something that I want to say to folks. Didn't tell me what it was. Just said at some point that she was going to share and that she wanted to go to the podium. Wow. Thank you. To have the, the courage to speak what's in your heart, where, why did you want to do this? Where did this come from? Because as you said, you're not a political person and, 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 it, and it shouldn't be seen that if you talk about the challenges that we're facing that it's all of a sudden, you're right, left, this, that, and the other. You're human, we're all human. Right. What was it that led you to say those words? Well, the truth is, I, this is part of a speech that I had, um, I was going to give in a college. And when I, they asked me for the speech so that they could 
look at it, um, they cut it down and cut out 90% of what's in here. Um, but I felt that it needed to be said. It was on my heart and where it came from. Well, when I was called to speak to these young people who are to be our, our next crop of leaders, um, I went into my prayer closet, literally went into my prayer closet and sat down and I said, Lord, I don't know what to say to them. I need you to tell me what to say. And I felt this almost like gurgling up in my spirit. And I grabbed my cell phone, my iPhone, and I put it on dictate. And I began to say, there goes an iPhone. <laughs> I didn't call you. And I began to say what I heard in my heart. And that's what it, I didn't change it, I didn't fix it, I had nothing, that's it. That's what came, right there. God bless you. Your, your story, your words, your music, who you are has been something that has helped a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Living your truth as you have, facing the challenges that you have. Uh, everybody's got something. Oh yeah. And you talked about the loss of your parents, you talked about, you didn't tell, talk about your sister who was lost in such tragic yes. ways yes. And, and such. How have you been able how have you been able to survive? I survive in that closet. <laughs> the prayer closet. Really, I do, in that prayer closet. I really do. I just take everything to God. My faith is, is very strong. I know God in a personal way that I believe he wants to know each and every one of us. And I sit down and I talk to my daddy and I say, you know, what's, I, I don't understand. Um, I do understand, but I don't like it. Um, uh, I need help in this. I, I, somebody else needs help. Uh, my friend, I, I'd like you to do this for so and so. We, you know, if it's your will be done, but please, can you? You know, I just go to him, and that's how I survive everything. Mm. I have this plaque in my dressing room, and it says, "This too shall pass." Amen. Now would be good. That's right. I'll just <laughs> That, that's helped me. That's true. That's, that's, that's true. true. It's true. It's right yeah. there. Right there in my mirror. That's true. That's As true. we conclude, a lot of people, we have different challenges. Mm. What is the one piece of advice you could give us to help us? I follow. I can only give you what I have. Mm -hmm. I follow one particular scripture, it's my favorite scripture. In all my ways, I acknowledge him, and he directs my paths. Amen. Gloria Gaynor, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your great work. Thank you. Oh no, she's gonna sing. She's gonna sing. Don't worry, she's gonna sing. Yeah. 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 This is gonna rise. There's gonna be a piano. It's the director of me, the producer. Rise. Yes. Oh, okay. I was wondering how that was gonna happen. Shall I? Let me in. I didn't know. I didn't even notice this thing behind me. How are you? Got so many burdens on my heart, questions weighing on my mind. I've grown so tired of all this madness, I'm wishing I could leave it all behind. And even now, fear and doubt keep trying to break me down, take me out. So hard to hear your voice and all this crazy noise. Take me back to 
day one when you drenched my heart in the water and I felt love for the first time breathe life into these weary lungs and take me back oh take me back to day one All my hope should be found in you, not the socials or the daily news. If they don't have the truth I need, only you can set me free. So take me back to day one, where you drenched my heart in the water and I felt love for the first time. Breathe life into these weary lungs and take me back Lord take me back to day one back to love, joy, peace and happiness where you gave this wayward child a second chance Cause where my soul finds comfort I find Rest oh. Take me back to day my heart in the water and I felt love for the first time breathe life into these weary lungs and take me back Lord take me back take me back oh take me back Day one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That's a sample. That's a sample of my forthcoming Christian album called Testimony. So look for it and let him take you back <laughs> in many areas. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's it. God bless you all. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon here, the rest of the evening. Please come into and enjoy the concert and because we're going to get down. We're gonna get down. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, we're going to let it all hang out and we want you to do the same. Have fun, enjoy, and be blessed. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.